And suddenly this date has magically doubled in length. And I hate everything. Hello friends and welcome back to Red X, your source for the freshest daily Reddit content. Like I said yesterday, today we are jumping right into r slash neckbeard stories. They are kind of like entitled parents, largely because they think they're better than anybody else, but they're just a bit more pathetic, so sometimes it's harder to laugh at them. You guys should let me know if you enjoyed this type of content. Anyways, without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into these stories. The Neckbeard Who Couldn't Take a Hint First time submitter, a little bit of a cross with r slash nice guys, but the story fits well here. We should do nice guys too, dang. In my second year of uni, I decided to use Tinder. Uh-oh. I had browsed before, but never committed to it, since it just seemed like a hookup app. Push comes to shove, and I'm questioning if I want a relationship, so I start using it seriously. I begin talking to a local guy. He's in the same uni, just a year below, doing some sort of design course, and his photos are nice. In his photos, he's a little overweight, but so am I, so I didn't judge. His beard is groomed. His blonde hair styled, and he's proudly showing off some generic tribal tattoos. On talking, everything seems legit. The conversation we had on the app was so generic, I can only tell you that it probably consisted of the same things most awkward intros include, alongside a few references to tattoos and whatever shows we were watching. A week in, and he invited me for coffee on campus. I say sure. It was the first time I had ever agreed to date from an online person, and I was soon to learn why I had waited so long. <laughs> Being me, I wanted to make a good first impression. I dress up, nice makeup, hair down, but clothes not too flashy. It's coffee, but it's visible I've made an effort, as my friend who catches me on the way down guesses that I've got a date. I sit there waiting, and after about ten minutes, I see him. He has visibly just rocked up out of bed, something he would admit to within five minutes of our conversation. His hair's unwashed and sticking up at angles. The anime jacket he's wearing, nothing overtly gaudy, is noticeably stained towards the bottom. He's actually thinner than his pictures, but getting closer there is the undeniable smell of a little B.O. His beard, which was neatly trimmed in his photos, is currently a poorly groomed and overgrown mess that stretches down his neck. <laughs> Hence the name. We sit down, and I don't really remember a lot of what he said, Again, the conversation is generic first date chatter until, suddenly, it isn't. Us talking about our travels abroad turns into him giving me a full ten minute talk on his year abroad in Germany, where of course all the girls ignored him. He focuses in on one particular female friend who got drunk all the time and emphasizes how good of a guy he was to look after her and not take advantage. Ugh. Creepy. He stresses how the girls saw him as one of them and didn't even look at him as a guy, as they were throwing themselves at German men. I control my face very well and try not to show the brewing realization behind my eyes. <laughs> I'm sat at a table, having coffee with a grown man who, within ten minutes of meeting me, wants to unleash his quarry of woes about women. This topic goes on. I'm unable to stop it for the sheer split in my soul between not wanting to rudely end the date with a man who may just be socially awkward and seeing all the red flags of a nice guy. Once the topic of his times in Germany are over, I've already decided that there will be no second date. However, we continue on, as it's only polite, and he hadn't done anything to outright deserve being dropped. Then the conversation took another turn. He spends the next 20 to 30 minutes talking about different anime shows, never much cutting in to ask what I think. In the entire conversation, including the part about Germany, I barely managed to do anything but smile and nod or ask innocuous questions. At the time, I genuinely did not know how to react to the real-life situation of a strange adult sitting me down to bitch about women I didn't know <laughs> over coffee. <laughs> I think walking away was probably the best option. I give him an hour to be polite, but then I've decided I've had enough. I stand to leave with a smile, telling him that I have something to do with the bank in town. And it was nice to meet him. This apparently was not what he heard, as he proceeded to say that he could accompany me. So, he walked the entire 25 minutes with me to the bank and stood outside as I made a deposit. Then to my joy, it turns out that we even live in the same sort of area by the uni and freak with the same shops. 
I suggest that I'm going to walk, and by cosmic design, <gasps> so is he. <laughs> he suggests a route back that I already semi-know, and it's all main streets in broad daylight. There's another 20 to 25 minutes worth of walking, and suddenly this date has magically doubled in length. And I hate everything. Again, I don't really remember the conversation. It was not interesting, but it was definitely of an anime bent. Something that I do enjoy, but after trying to shake this guy for what had probably been an hour, I was so unimpressed. <laughs> I then slipped back into a mild bitching about the girls back in Germany, and the final straw was an offhand comment comparing real girls to anime girls. <laughs> I think I laughed. He walked past his own apartment to walk me to a local shop closer to my house. I told him I was stopping there so he wouldn't know where I lived. After everything, I literally patted him on the back and said goodbye. I was not even going to hug him after such an atrocious first date. Saw him at the shop again a few months later, but luckily I was with a male housemate who I think he mistook for my boyfriend. That still didn't stop him from following me around the aisles for ten solid minutes. Online dating. Never again. I wouldn't knock online dating too hard, OP. I mean, you do have to sort through a lot of trash. I mean, a lot of trash, but... <laughs> If you're really determined, you can find a good one. I'll go ahead and admit to you now that I met my wife online, but it did take me a good six months of conversation before I'm like, okay, it's worth traveling 7,000 miles to at least meet her. And before I met her, there were, you know, the parade of losers that just thought that I could offer them something, which I honestly can't. I'm in a very well-off place by uh, Filipino standards, but by American standards, I am I am on the poverty line. <laughs> And my wife seems to understand that, so she's a keeper. But yeah, this guy was obviously just pretty unhinged. And I assume German girls are just like every other girl in the world and can smell like a simp or a beta male <laughs> and write them off. I think it was the late great comedian Patrice O'Neill who said that when Americans are outside of America, they're like Superman. Everybody loves them. Everybody wants to, you know, hang out with them. They think they could do anything. It's not until you get back to America that you turn back into Clark Kent. And uh, <laughs> in my experience, that's kind of true. This guy was obviously bitter, at least in some type of way, even before he went. But I ain't going to break down the psychology of that. <laughs> I've rambled far too much for this story. So let's jump into another one. Oh boy, you're going to love it. My 300-pound neckbeard vampire life. <laughs> can't even get through the title without cracking up. Long post, but I just found this sub and wanted to share my best neckbeard tale. This happened back when I was in high school, but we had a vampire pack, as they called themselves, of neckbeard vampires <laughs> at my high school. I don't mean they just dressed decked out in the tackiest Hot Topic ensemble they could find either. They full-on tried to convince people that they were real-life vampires, up to and including fucking hissing at people they were mad at. <laughs> For a group that bragged on and on about how different they were among a flock of sheep. They looked like they came with the same cookie cutter with patchy beards, unwashed hair, trench coats, fedoras, and those real ugly baggy trip pants with all the chains, and even the single female neckbeard vampires dressed like them. <laughs> all of them claimed to have abandoned their mortal names and insisted they be called edgy names like chaos, destruction, and my favorite, shadow vein. <laughs> They'd legit even argue with teachers who'd call them their real name, like Steve. <laughs> Whenever you called them out for being able to stand in sunlight or show up in pictures, they would say some dumb <laughs> like, that's just anti-vampire propaganda pushed by the church and Hollywood. The worst was how disruptive they were in class. They would answer every question with some goofy-ass dark answer that had nothing to do with the question and sounded like it came from Jared Leto's junior high school poetry journal. At one point, the female neckbeard decided that she had a crush on me and wasn't going to take no for an answer. I'm talking going as far as showing up to my house and sitting on my porch waiting for me to come outside and leaving creepy little deviant fantasy-filled love letters on my locker you want to know how I finally got rid of her? I had to play their game and make up some elaborate lie about coming from a long line of vampire hunters. 
I was just being a smartass, figuring she'd realize I was just mocking her. But they were so deep into their delusion that she acted like it was real, even handing me a sad note the next day about how crushed she was. The destiny had forced us apart. <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I didn't have the tiniest bullying streak when I was a teen, but I couldn't help myself around these, <laughs> these sort of people. I hung out with the actual punk and goth kids, so you can imagine how many of my female friends got harassed by Nosfer Dipshit and Co. Can we call him Nosferatard? <laughs> That's not politically correct these days, I guess. I once brought a spray bottle to school filled with holy water I got from the local church and went around lightly spritzing them since it was likely the only shower that they had that week, only to be met with the previously mentioned hissing. My favorite interaction was the time I got to class early and left a crucifix and garlic on one of their desks. They waddled in and saw it, and they were furious, and instantly screamed at the teacher about it. The teacher dragged us outside, and the interaction went like this. Teacher, OP, what's going on? Vamp says you're harassing them? Vamp, yeah, he's insulting my beliefs. Teacher, now OP, you know we don't tolerate that kind of thing here. OP, what, that he believes he's a vampire? Teacher, come on, OP, he doesn't be- Vamp, believe- no, I am a vampire. <laughs> the teacher just stopped dead with an exhausted look on her face, looked at Fat Vamp for a minute, looked at me, and then back at the vamp again before going, you know what, just keep separated from each other. <laughs> Eventually that kid got expelled for writing a big revenge manifesto on MySpace. Oh god, what a throwback. On MySpace, with a bunch of kids' names on it, including... Yours truly, TLDR, went to school with morbidly obese vampires. <laughs> How much blood you gotta drink to get <laughs> to get 300 pounds? My god, dude. The premise alone is just so funny. I can't even talk about morbidly obese vampires without wanting to laugh. <laughs> Now, I'm totally all for respecting one's beliefs, but come on, dude, where do we draw the line? You know what I mean? Good lord. I'd like to look up some of those kids and see what they're doing now. They probably grew out of it. I mean, <laughs> I've not met a 30-year-old that honestly insists that they're a werewolf or a vampire or any of the things that, that teenagers kind of try and do to fit in. God bless those lost little souls. <laughs> You probably shouldn't have picked on him, OP, but god damn if it's not funny. Oh. Don't you call me Pudgy Portly or Stout and tell me once again who's fat. Just finished up my first year at my dream college, and it was summer break in Florida. Take him off the glass! Take him off the glass! The unfortunate time with Gothic Horse Beard. Gothic Horse Beard. Say that again for the people in the back. Gothic horse beard. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? I guess we'll find out. So, please excuse any grammar errors. I'll try to fix them as I go. But the South Carolina education system just kind of sucks. Ah, 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 OP. The American education system just kind of sucks. <laughs> oh, Lord. Anyways, here's our cast. OP, someone who was having a hard time and just wanted any friend that I could hold on to. Aww. Gothic horse beard. The gay neckbeard, who is the main focus of today's story. Italy. She was closer to Gothic horse beard, but we were still good friends. And Shy Guy. He wasn't actually shy, just quiet. He never really talked, but he did interact with the group, and we are still friends to this day. So let us start from the beginning of junior year. Luckily, I didn't have too many classes with Gothic Horse Beard, but one class that we did have was about two hours long. We'll get into that soon. So, how I joined this group of misfits was by complete accident. My high school offered kids to join a program called Career Center. For ones who don't know what Career Center is, it's like a training school for kids still in high school where you get to learn about the field that you want to go into if the Career Center offered classes in that field, and you'd get a certification to jump into your field after high school without having to go to college first. Good deal. 
I joined an engineering program, and as juniors, we go to the career center first thing in the morning for two classes. I mean, that seems pretty legit, doesn't it? Why are we bashing the education system? <laughs> if it works, it works. We'd stand at the bus area waiting for the bus to pick us up and take us to career center, and I just so happened to start talking to these people, and before I knew it, we were just kind of friends. Gothic Horsebeard, Shy Guy, and I were all in the same field. Italy was learning culinary, and she was really good at it. At this time, I didn't know what a neckbeard was, but now, watching a lot of Reddit videos on YouTube, I can say, with confidence, that he was a neckbeard, aside from a few of his more uncommon traits. Gothic Horsebeard did shower. He never smelled, and he never tried to hit on me, thank God. But do not be fooled. Gothic Horsebeard was a neckbeard from head to toe. He has a beard that would grow on his neck and never past his chin. He was overweight, absolutely, and if anyone tried to tell him otherwise, he would just say, I'm just big boned. <laughs> Where have I heard that before? Not joking, he would show his legs and show you that his legs were not fat, but muscles. I guess he didn't understand how different bodies store fat in different places. He always wore the same black, long-sleeved My Little Pony sweater. I'm not joking, it could be 98 degrees outside. As I said in my disclaimer, I live in South Carolina, so the humidity is stupid here in the summer, and our winters don't last long if we even get real winters. But he would wear that damn sweater every day with black fingerless gloves. <laughs> He also had long hair that was thinning, and he kept it in a low ponytail, and when asked why he wouldn't cut it, he would say, Because it was his luxurious mane. <laughs> ah, horse beard. And I guess the gothic part, we're getting to it as well. He thought of himself as a horse furry. I'm not joking, he was obsessed with furries. He always wore black cargo pants with metal chains, and the same black and white Vans shoes. Thinking about it now, I am so glad that he was gay and had a long-distance relationship with someone because it could have been much worse otherwise. I will say, for my junior year, everything was relatively fine. We were all friends, getting along, and enjoying the rest of our teenage years. The real issues came in senior year, as I was getting over a lot of my issues, and I was starting to become a better person. I will say that I did start going to church and was getting into my faith, and I don't think Gothic Horsebeard liked that. Not because I was talking about my faith, but because what was funny to me before just wasn't anymore. Yep, that's part of maturing, I suppose. <laughs> we were the group of misfits that would say Holocaust jokes and not think twice about it. We always say that we hated the skew and wanted to blow it up with everyone inside. Wow, super edgy bros. I'm already glad that you pulled yourself out of this kind of bullshit OP. <laughs> Of course, we never did actually blow up the school. How many times can I say blow up the school before I get demonetized? <laughs> I just went along with all this to be a part of the group, of course. That was a dumb thing to do, but it doesn't really matter anymore. At first, I didn't notice Gothic Horsebeard acting any different until I realized that he just wouldn't talk to me like he used to. And one time I even confronted him about it, and I asked him, why are you being so mean to me? And he responded, when did you start being a bitch? That really hurt, coming from someone who was supposed to be my friend. Then I noticed that Gothic Horsebeard only wanted to talk to me when I was having a bad day and acting like my old self. But anytime I actually seemed happy or was trying to improve myself, Gothic Horsebeard didn't want to hear it or even be around me. I really noticed when I was on the bus to Career Center that he wasn't talking to me again, and soon I started not feeling okay. And when we got to Career Center, I was in a gloomy, grumpy mood, and Gothic Horsebeard was talking about something dealing with a hangman game, and I said a comeback that made him laugh, and then he was trying to talk to me again. But that comeback that I made, I didn't like it, and it felt wrong. But you did it anyway. Okay, but then like, why did you make it? <laughs> it's just like muscle memory or something? What is going on there? Then I really started to notice his superiority complex. If I said something wrong, he always had to correct me and made me feel stupid. Don't get me wrong, if I'm wrong about something, I'll admit it. And sometimes I'll even say, I'm not sure if this is right, so don't quote me. 
and he just always had to butt in and tell me I was wrong. He purposely leaves me out of conversation, talks over me like I wasn't already talking to Italy or Shy Guy, and if Shy Guy Italy and I were talking about something without gothic horse beard, he would always pout, put in his earbuds, and listen to his gothic music and pretend we weren't there. It's not gothic music, it's industrial. God, Mom, you don't understand anything. <laughs> Uh, I remember one time Italy was talking about going to this Comic-Con with some of her girlfriends as it was a weekend trip for them, and Gothic Horsebeard was asking if he could hang out with them if he went. Italy told him no, and that she was seeing friends that she hadn't seen in years, but it caused a fight between them that lasted for two weeks until the con was over, and then they were just back to being best friends again. <laughs> okay then. Of course, in those two weeks, Shy Guy and I were in the middle of hearing about it from Gothic Horsebeard about how Italy was a bitch not to let him hang out with her at the con, and he thought they were supposed to be friends. <laughs> you can be friends and not be together at every waking moment. Of course, I'm someone who can see a point of view from both sides of the argument, but really, I was on Italy's side. I understand that she saw us every day at school and she just wanted time to be with her old friends. I completely understand her anger with Gothic Horsebeard. I don't know if Gothic Horsebeard went to the con or not, we all just seem to forget about it, but Italy did show me pictures of the con, and her cosplay looked really cool. I probably made this post much longer than it needed to be, but I've been holding this back for a while and just really wanted to get it out. Gothic Horsebeard and Italy are the kind of people to be on Reddit, so Gothic Horsebeard and Italy if you are reading this or listening to this on YouTube by some random chance, just know that even though we had our problems, I still appreciate you too. You were my friends. Mostly Italy, but... <laughs> Gothic Horse Beard, I hope you're living your best life, dude. Yep, sounds mostly like edgy awkward teens being edgy awkward teens. <laughs> Nothing to see here at the end of the day. There was a bit of cringe, but it was very light cringe. I understand where most of these characters are coming from because... I was in high school at one point too, believe it or not. I did get my American education, and look look at all I've done with it. I started a YouTube channel. <laughs> Hooray. I definitely understand growing apart from like your high school friend groups and stuff like that. High school friends generally do not last. I had many, many friends in high school, and I've got about three of them left. <laughs> so I wouldn't put too much investment in it. You know, OP is growing up and is like, well, I don't really think Holocaust jokes are that funny anymore. And I'm sure a decade down the road, Gothic Horsebeard realized that, huh, you're right. <laughs> That's a pretty shitty thing to say. And hopefully he stopped saying it. Hopefully he became like a normal person. Well, as normal as a horse furry can be. You know, no kink shame, but <laughs> also no kink same. <laughs> I don't get it, but you do you, bro. If it gets your rocks off, then uh, you just enjoy yourself in the privacy of your own home and never, ever talk to me about it. <laughs> so yeah, I have high hopes for everyone in this post. They're young. They'll get it together. Don't you worry about it. This is like borderline cringe, borderline neckbeard stuff, <laughs> but nothing that we need to be concerned about. However, if you couldn't tell from the title... That will inevitably change as we get into our second story. <laughs> Just wanted to ease you guys into it. Neckbeard tricks me into drawing inflation fetish commissions. <laughs> oh no. Good lord. This video is going to get demonetized for sure. Holocaust, blow up the school, inflation fetish. <laughs> I'm sorry, whatever bot is scanning this video. Anyways, <laughs> first time posting. I've watched a lot of YouTubers share some stories. R slash Tim Tam Tom, Vincey, and Red X to name a few. And after cleaning through my Google Drive, I was reminded of my very own neckbeard tale. If anyone wants to read these for their YouTube channels, go right ahead. You got my permission. And also, hi. Oh, hey, OP. How's it going? Pajama Paladin, I like your username. I hope that you see this video. Say hi to me in the comments. Because <laughs> I said hi to you in the video. Because you said hi to me in your post. Okay, anyways. <laughs> if there's formatting 
or typo issues, I apologize. I'm typing this on my phone, but I'll do my best to avoid them. This might be a bit long, so grab yourself a snack and enjoy some secondhand cringe. The most tasty kind of all. This took place about five years ago. Just finished up my first year at my dream college, and it was summer break in Florida. My dad and I were just barely scraping by and lived in a retirement community for the season. The rent was crazy cheap, and while the mobile home was super dated, it had its charms. I'm an artist by trade, so to assemble some fun money and keep my hands busy during the break, I opened up commissions on my Tumblr account. Ah, see, there's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> I had a decent following for my work, so yeah, the commissions brought in some moderate rainy day money, like $50 to $150 a month on average. But then, he came along. Just for a bit of context, I don't mind making not safe for work commissions. I took figure drawing classes, but usually I would only agree to draw this sort of content if it met certain conditions. I drew characters just naked, and very rarely scenarios where they were actually doing the deed. Also, at that time, I was way past a freshman 15. I was a chunky gal at 300 pounds. I was recently recovering from escaping a toxic household, and I had severe depression. Food was my coping mechanism, but you're not here for that story. Well, I'm sorry to hear it, OP. I'm, I'm here if you need to talk. I can always offer some words of encouragement for you. I hope you are doing better now. Anyways, this is where our neckbeard comes in, sliding, oozing into my Tumblr PMs to commission me. Let's call him Artbeard for the kicks and gigs. We already have an Artbeard. I'm going to call him Inflation Beard. <laughs> I'm sure that this guy did not really mean anything malicious by his behavior, but the way he acted in particular towards me made me extremely uncomfortable. Of course, it didn't start out that way. And at the time, I was still super naive. I was raised incredibly sheltered, and so I'm a novice as far as street smarts goes. Inflation Beard commissioned me for a set of three bust sketches of plus-size characters, which I didn't mind. Big girls are pretty too, and their anatomy is fairly easy to draw. I was not familiar with who this character was at that time, so I didn't think much of it. Three rough sketches later, and hey, I made 20 bucks. I thought that was the end of it. Oh boy, was I wrong. The weekend arrives, and Inflation Beard reaches out in my PMs once again. Inflation Beard, Hey there, I really love the pieces you did for me. They're just so amazing. Thank you. OP, hey man, no problem. Glad you like them. Inflation Beard, Can I ask you a question? OP, uh, sure, what's up? Inflation Beard, can I commission you for another set of sketches of this character? OP? Uh, yeah, sure. No problem. Inflation Beard? And, uh, could you make the character a little bigger in these sketches? OP? You want them to be chubbier? Inflation Beard? Yes, please. OP? Sure. I don't really have a problem with that. Just PayPal me and I'll have them for you by the end of the week. I really didn't see any problem with it. The characters were fully clothed. They were just chubby, smiling gals. No harm there. Plus, he was really happy with the work, and it was nice to have a regular customer. At the start, at least, it was innocent. It's always how it starts. Bit by bit, you gotta watch the crawl. Inflation Beard began to commission me weekly by the time July had hit. We'd become moderate friends at the time, casually chatting about life and stuff. And then his requests were getting weirder. He requested things like these characters to be wearing super tight clothing that was tearing with the buttons popping off. And then he began commissioning me for full body colored pieces. Additionally, he requested characters that I was familiar with, like Harley Quinn and Wendy from Gravity Falls, and then human versions of characters like Rarity and Pinkie Pie from My Little Pony. God, we got two bronies in the same episode? What are the odds? Actually, pretty high, probably, among neckbeards. <laughs> I'm not as familiar with that show, but tragically familiar with that fan base. 
drawing him cuddling all these gargantuan characters, getting lost in their massive breasts and bellies. All the while, he would request cuddles and hugs from me. He was getting pretty familiar with me, which, being all alone for the summer, he was someone that I saw as a friend. I confided in him that I was self-conscious about my own appearance and the like, and we had similar interests in shows. I had plenty of friends online, but this was beginning to unnerve me. He kept on calling me beautiful and cute, despite never having seen a photo of me. <laughs> what a weirdo. He would also mention and hint towards flirting. Luckily, the summer was drawing to a close, but Inflation Beard had one last commission for me. Is the money worth it? Is it really worth it? <laughs> Inflation Beard. Hey there again, friend. OP. Hey there, man. What's up? Inflation Beard. Are you busy right now? OP. Eh, just kind of getting things together to move back on campus. Inflation Beard. Nice, nice. Do you have time for a commission? OP. Uh, it depends. Time is kind of out of my hands at the moment. Inflation Beard. If you could do a full-colored, full-body painting of Pinkie Pie as a human, naked and lying in bed with her face covered in cake and pie, <laughs> with me sitting on top of her boobies feeding it to her, I'll send you a reference to your email of how I want it to look. <laughs> oh, God. Daddy, chill. I got that email about a half an hour later. The images attached to it made me nauseous. There were these women absolutely bloated beyond what is anatomically possible, with either tubes full of food stuffing their cheek and spilling out of their lips, or somebody dedicated to doing exactly that for them. The gargantuan girls in question were either begging for more food or pleading that they were too full. And this is when I learned about inflation fetish porn. Now, don't get me wrong. To each their own, I do not judge what gets your rocks off, but I was personally becoming involved with Inflation Beard's sick fantasies, and I was really uncomfortable with it. And it's okay to voice that, OP. You just say, no kink shame, but no kink same. <laughs> That's the mantra for my life these days. <laughs> I made up some excuse that a commission that complex was going to take too much time, and I couldn't do it. He tried to convince me that he'd be fine with just a sketch. But I reminded him that he had plenty of my sketches, that he was practically paying me $40 a week for these sketches, and that now that summer was over, all commissions were cut off. You would think that would be the end of it. I thought so too. Not when neckbeards are involved. <laughs> The school year started back up, and he was still chatting with me, as friends, <laughs> I'm sure. I usually just gave one-word responses, despite his continued requests for hugs and cuddles, and calling me friendo. <laughs> what the hell is even that? But then, the worst happened. Inflation Beard. Hey again. OP. Hey. Inflation Beard. Can I ask you a question? OP. Uh, I guess. Inflation Beard. You're a plus size girl, right? OP. Yeah. Inflation Beard. Can I see a picture of you? OP. No. Why? Inflation Beard. I was gonna use it as a reference. OP. For what? Now, I thought this was some shady way to get a picture of me, but Inflation Beard then proceeded to explain to me that he was planning to cosplay human Pinkie Pie for conventions. <laughs> oh boy. But not just any version of Pinkie Pie. Oh no. He wanted to cosplay the super inflated version of Pinkie Pie that he had commissioned me to draw for him. He wants to go to conventions as Fat Pinkie Pie? <laughs> Alright bro, you do you, but like, is this real life? <laughs> and of course it got so much worse. 
He showed me pictures of his progress. The pictures that he sent was of a very lanky young nerd. And I shit you not, this wife beater tank top stuffed to the stitches with pillows. He had stuffed a bra far beyond capacity as well. Inflation beard. I snuck the bra from my mom. She's pretty big as well. <laughs> my dad doesn't want to help pay for a pink shirt. So I got to take extra shifts at my job. <laughs> How much does a pink shirt cost, bro? I'll PayPal you the cost of a pink shirt. I do not want you to take extra shifts around actual human beings. <laughs> I've also been eating almost five meals a day now because I just want to get bigger just like you. God, this is so cringy. Oh, God. Seeing that image and that message, I ran out of my dorm and had to throw up in the toilet. That was just going way, way too far for me. That night, I couldn't sleep. Looking at my own body, I regularly felt gross and sick, sure, but this was different. Something snapped and I wanted to change. I did not want to be affiliated with those drawings, with those helplessly bloated girls completely dependent on some perv giving them treats and snacks. It is a really strange and specific fetish, but this is not the first time I've seen it pop up either. The next morning, I went to the campus gym, and I did that every weekday until I graduated. Halfway along the way, Inflation Beard poked at me again. Check again. When I told him that I was losing weight, he was upset. He told me, I was beautiful when I was big and he gradually lost interest, thank God. Eventually, I stopped hearing from him altogether. Five years later, present day, I'm living in California. I've lost half of my body weight, and I'm now 150 pounds, still following a lifestyle of healthier food choices and exercise. I actually just recovered from a procedure because I had a lot of excess skin that I needed to remove, so it kind of worked out for me in the end. Last week, when I was cleaning out my drive, I found the pieces of big bloated gals just sitting there collecting cyber dust. <laughs> I instantly deleted them, but I laughed remembering the tale. Oh god, I'm so glad you could laugh at it, OP. It's really <laughs> quite horrifying to me. He does seem sort of just socially unaware that not everybody shares his extremely niche fetish, but he's also like trying to get the OP involved, which is where the real rub comes, you know what I mean? If you're just, whatever, he's paying you to make these sketches, I guess it's fine. But when he's asking OP how big she is and, like, encouraging her not to lose weight, that that's where things go too far. You know what I mean? I'm sure this was not a fun experience for OP to have. It seems really creepy and cringy, but in the end, I guess it did work out well for OP. You know, it motivated her to get into the gym, lose some of the weight, not be one of those uh, feed pigs. I think that's what they call them. <laughs> that this guy is so into. I have to wonder if he ever gained the weight that he so desired to gain, turn himself into a feed pig. I, I found out about this fetish uh, via OnlyFans, unfortunately, so I think I was looking for like some fat guy pictures and that showed this like transformation from like a good looking muscular dude to just like a giant fat pig. But he's also making like $4,000, $5,000 a month on OnlyFans, so is your health worth that? I guess it is to him, but I don't think that I could ever find myself doing that. Like, man, that's that's too far. Maybe he enjoys it, though, you know? Again, no kink shaming, but it is sort of sad that people have to destroy their bodies in such a way for some sort of sexual gratification. Ugh, God, this video is going to get demonetized for sure. <laughs> Jerry and the chicken porn. Not safe for work. Okay, I'm pretty sure this fits into the neckbird category. If not, I guess I'll move it elsewhere. But I had to get this story out at some point or another because 
There is no possible way for this kind of shit to come up organically in conversation, and I refuse to take this story to my grave. <laughs> my first and probably only Reddit post, just to make sure that this did not follow me to the afterlife untold. Possible trigger warning, slight mention of suicide threats. So anyways, back in high school I was pretty unassuming, but a seriously troubled girl. I struggled with depression and battled suicidal thoughts constantly, so much so that I was actually selected for a program that I will keep the name of secret, but the long story short was that it was for kids whose mental health or learning disabilities made them either a danger to themselves or others in regular classrooms. I was in the former category, but the other students that I encountered were largely the latter, and there were some real violent ones in this batch. Now, there was a whole lot of shit wrong with me, but one thing that my teacher and her two paras could unequivocally agree on was that I was honestly the least disruptive person in the small group of program attendees because all my behavioral issues had to do with myself instead of, for example, authority or other students. So imagine my surprise when one day the teacher waved me down just as we got ready for lunch and split me off while the pairs herded the others towards the lunchroom. Miss B was easily the best teacher I could have ever asked for. Super nice, always tried to make the class fun so that we could actually enjoy and engage, and seriously did her best to always make sure that we felt heard. Today was weird though. She looked, well, for lack of a better word, fed right the F up. It's been ages and the conversation's exact details have been lost to time, but it basically went like this. Ms. B, Calf, I need to ask you a question. OP discreetly shoves phone, which I technically wasn't supposed to have, deeper into my hoodie pocket. What's up, B? Miss B, do you know if anyone's been printing anything lately? Well, we were in the middle of a speech project, so it was kind of hard to point to a single face in the classroom that hadn't printed off something in the past few days. I pointed this out, and I distinctly remember that Miss B's eyelid twitched slightly. <laughs> Miss B, right, uh... I should have been more specific, um, well, images, I mean, not articles or speeches. OP, can't imagine. We were supposed to do this assignment without visual aids, right? Miss B, yes. So if you know if anyone's printed any images, OP, maybe I could ask, what were they? I know what all my group's speech topics. At this point, Miss B really hesitated. See, a fun little detail is that while our program was meant to help kids with behavioral issues, it had next to no funding, and the printer was older than I was at the time, roughly 16 or 17. This meant that it didn't have a printing history, and would often spit out prints out of order and would sometimes wait an hour before actually printing what it was asked to. I heard it act up earlier in the class right as we were getting ready for lunch, but I hadn't thought much of it until it activated again and Miss B realized way too late that it was spitting out another of the images that she was trying to find the responsibility bearer of. My jaw dropped to the freaking ground. Without hesitation, Mrs. B, of course, snatches it up and feeds it into the paper shredder, whom my class had glued googly eyes to and called the paper monster. But it was too late and I had seen. <laughs> oh, had I seen. So you know how YouTube has all those fun little source filmmaker animations? And for a while, they were popular with Five Nights at Freddy's fans? Ah uh, yeah, title relevant. Someone in my class had printed out creepy, humanized, source filmmaker pornography of Five Nights at Freddy characters. What the fuck, right? Mrs. B practically growled in frustration and unplugged the printer and then turned to me. Do you know who might have decided that that was a good idea? Oh, did I know? I knew the instant I recognized Toy Chica. See, there was this guy, let's call him Jerry, name changed for obvious reasons. Jerry was a mostly unassuming kid at first. He was skinny as hell, never went anywhere without his hoodie on, with the hood up. Honestly though, once you got to know him, he was kind of a huge douche. For one, he hated the teacher and her paras, claiming that they had some sort of old woman vendetta against him because he liked certain things. God. <laughs> he slouched a lot, greasy hair that I rather hated to look at, a patchy stash, 
He was antisocial, had a lot of anger issues, and trouble with authority, which is what landed him in our program in the first place. And more known to the rest of his fellow students than anything else about him was that he was a Five Nights at Freddy's freak. He'd skulk and scowl all day long until lunchtime ran around. Then he'd snatch one of the laptops from the cart and lurk out in the lunchroom, plug in his headphones and watch YouTube videos of nothing but Five Nights at Freddy's. Oh boy. Oh boy. Well, the guy was a massive douche, and more than once I'd caught him staring at my friend at the time's ass, plus he'd exposed my goddamn eyes to more of Toy Chica than I would have ever wanted to see in this life, and even the next few lifetimes after this one. So no pity from a woman flashed by murderous robot chicken snoo snoo. R slash <laughs> brand new sentence. So I mentioned that I'd seen old Jerry Boy watching more PG videos, but that it was definitely the same character. I was dismissed to lunch, and when we were eventually corralled back into the classroom, Mrs. B announced without the slightest bit of hesitation that we'd be suspending the speech project for the day, and we'd instead just focus on the study period. I thought that was the end of it, but to my eternal chagrin with Jerry, it was not. My then friend, who we'll call Iris, had a higher tolerance against bullshit than I did, and she was tentative friends with Jerry, despite me warning her that I got weird vibes from him. And it was that night that I woke up at perhaps one in the morning to find that Iris was ringing me. I barely managed to garble out a hello in my half-asleep stupor before she wailed like a banshee and asked me what you're supposed to do if someone says they want to commit suicide. As it turns out, Jerry had been bugging her ever since school had ended that, Oh my god, some bitch in our class ratted me out. I just wanted some pictures because my mom threw out our old printer, and the teachers confiscated my laptop privileges. I swear to god this school wants me to kill myself. And other such and such peppered with how, You're the only thing keeping me here, I swear. So that's the secret. Gotta get rid of Iris to get rid of Jerry. <laughs> Sacrifices must be made. Oof. Did I not like that. What Jerry didn't know was that Iris might have been too scared to tell anyone, but... I sure as shit wasn't. I told her to tell Miss B and take screenshots of any text as well. The fallout was ridiculous. Miss B immediately insisted that Iris block Jerry's number, moved Iris to the other side of the classroom, and made sure to put some of the tallest students between them so that Jerry wouldn't be making any eye contact whatsoever. His mother was alerted to both the fun little images that he'd printed out and the suicide threats and he was forbidden to go near Iris without a staff member present. I don't believe he ever found out that I was the one that ratted him out on either of those transgressions, but he wasn't allowed on the laptops without supervision the rest of the time he was there. I graduated out of the program and ended up drifting out of contact with everyone that I'd met there, but the story stuck with me because it just blew my mind that he thought it was a wise idea to print out pictures of Five Nights at Freddy Porn. And then he'd also thought it was a similarly brilliant idea to threaten to kill himself just because he couldn't look at them. <laughs> Side note, seriously, who prints porn? Why not just watch it and move along? Well, OP, let me tell you something about being a, a growing boy. <laughs> Sometimes you know very young that you get off to robot chicken vaginas and you want that close at hand for when the mood strikes. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jerry, man. He's never going to live that down. I'm surprised it was just the school that seemed to have like the fallout against him. I'm shocked that the other students weren't like constantly making fun of him or something like that because, oh my God, dude, how do you ever live that down? That's just too wild. I know these Five Nights at Freddy's fans, it, w it was big for a while, you know? You couldn't take two steps in any direction without running into somebody who was head over heels for that game. I never really got it as a game. It's just like, okay, jump scare simulator, whoopee doo. But there are people that are like way into the lore. I, I don't want to go too hard against them because Lord, they're going to find this video. <laughs> It'd be like, somebody's talking. <laughs> somebody's talking about Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. <laughs> oh, God. I think the, the Game Theory channel's biggest videos are all on Five Nights at Freddy's. 
the fan base is just fervent. So if the, the comment section devolves, you'll know exactly why. <laughs> but uh, I ain't into Chica. I, I can't imagine <laughs> hanging out with somebody that was. But yeah, you really have no obligation to make like whatever your fetish is known to anybody. So why would you print that out? It's like if somebody printed out pictures of those Japanese girls that puke on each other. <laughs> and if you don't know what I'm talking about, good. <laughs> Let's just move on to the next story. Goth beard. My freshman year roommate. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> When I first came across this sub, I had quite a few laughs at the stories, but then I realized I have a few neckbeard stories from my own life. This is a long one, but it's a good one, I think. It certainly makes me laugh just recalling it. So I started college back in 2010, and while I don't know if the term neckbeard was a thing at the time, they were certainly around. I played ice hockey growing up, and I was just barely talented enough at it to get a few scholarship offers. Although, I was told that when I got to campus, I would be rooming with other student-athletes. Upon receiving my dorm assignment, I found out that due to a record enrollment, I would start my college career in a regular dorm. So I move in, and I'm in a quad, myself and three other guys. Two of them seem normal enough, but one is this tall, very round, pale guy with small oval glasses dressed in all black with those stereotypical goth poofy parachute pants with spikes and chains on them that could have only been a Hot Topic purchase. <laughs> I distinctly remember that he also kept a very sparse beard that lined his chin in what seemed to be a half attempt at a bad chin strap style. I figured I'm gonna be living with the guy, and although I could have made some accurate assumption by his initial appearance, I desperately wanted to make friends quickly, so I attempted a conversation. Goffbeard let me know very quickly that he was very private and that I should never go through his things. Although that felt like an odd statement, I agreed, because why would I want to go through his things? The quad had bunk beds, and in the first five minutes of our discussion, I noticed that Goffbeard had taken to a lower bunk and was unpacking what looked like shower rings and blackout curtains. In an effort to keep the conversation lighthearted, I asked him about them. He quickly, without hesitation or shame, let me know that he had curtains so that he could watch Ported Anime privately. I always thought that it was weird that he mentioned both of those. <laughs> and that they were also so that he knew that he would be able to bring women back to the room without having to worry about being spied upon. Yeah, that'll happen. <laughs> I did manage to keep the conversation cordial after that, but like, WTF, right? <laughs> to say the least. I mentally told myself that I wouldn't have to spend a ton of time in the dorm with him since I would be starting daily conditioning with my team in the next couple of weeks, and I would get to move to another dorm next semester. Anyways, the next few weeks, I didn't have to talk with Gothbeard much, although he was seemingly always in the room, his curtain was almost always closed. I started to avoid the dorm as much as possible. I noticed the room smelled like unwashed socks. Instead, I started hanging out with some guys down the hall that would leave their room door open all the time, and they would mostly play sports video games like Madden and FIFA. By hanging out in their open room, I quickly met almost the entire dorm floor, including a couple of gorgeous girls. One of them, I'll call her Elle, started coming down to the gamer room pretty frequently just to hang out. One evening, we were playing Madden as usual, and Gothbeard appeared in the open doorway. Despite the fact that I technically lived with him, I hadn't seen him in probably about four days. <laughs> Count your blessings. He said, I'm disappointed. I was hoping there were some real gamers in here, but I see you all only like to play <laughs> trash games. Jocks are all the same. And then he left. We all looked at each other awkwardly, and after I explained that he was my roommate, we had a laugh about it. It also became apparent that Elle wasn't into games. She wanted to hang out with the guys. Over the following days, we realized that we had a mutual interest in each other, and we started dating. The relationship started fast, but hey, we're freshmen, and it was nice to have a girlfriend while trying to navigate the new world that was college life. 
Anyways, my hockey schedule picked up, and I had less and less time to hang out with my dorm friends or L. Gothbeard would audibly grumble at me when I would get out of bed at 6am to go practice, despite the fact that there wasn't anything I could do to change that. Some weeks I would travel for games, and Gothbeard would make comments about how he could finally bring a lady or two over, <laughs> though I never saw him with girls, ever. <laughs> yeah boy. One day, after getting home from an away game, I met up with Elle to watch a movie. I was tired, so I was looking forward to spending some time with her. Her roommate was talking loudly on the phone in their room, so she walked with me to my room. I flicked on the light, and no one seemed to be around. Gothbeard's curtain was closed, so I asked if he was there. No response. This was the first time that my room had been empty, so I took the opportunity to have a little makeout session with Elle on my bed. I pulled off Elle's shirt so she was in just a bra, and we continued. Then, I heard it. A distinct, Ugh, yeah, <laughs> muttered from the bunk bed across the room. I turned and looked up to see Gothbeard's curtain pulled back halfway, with him shirtless and his arm making movements back and forth. I'm extremely thankful now that the curtain was only pulled halfway back. Then, without missing a beat, he said something else that I'll never forget. What are you looking at me for? Keep going. I threw the covers over Elle, and she put her shirt back on. Then, I got out of the bed and said, What the fuck, man? I asked you if you were here. To which he calmly replied, I know. I avoided my own room as much as I could for the rest of the semester. I don't think I had more than one conversation during that time with him. The following semester, I was able to move to an actual student-athlete dorm, and L came over most days. If not for Gothbeard, I would have stayed, but that guy was something else. It wasn't far from the original dorm hall. She told me that Gothbeard assumed that by moving away that I had dumped her, and that he had started texting her regularly regarding his affections for her. He even referred to me as an obviously abusive meathead, and that she deserves a gentlemen like himself that would basically worship her and spy on her he later <laughs> he later went on to ask her for nudes then he went on an angry text tirade after she turned him down of course and then he threw a fit about it in front of her and a bunch of my friends citing that he had already seen her in her underwear so what's the big deal <laughs> <laughs> i wish i was there to see that one the last I remember of him, he was whining in a super obviously directed way on social media about how women don't appreciate or value kind men. No dude, she had a boyfriend, you're weird as hell, and you're not kind. I have no idea what Gothbeard is up to these days, but I hope that he was able to straighten himself out a bit. What are you looking at me for? Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, big oof, dude. <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe if OP was into that, but quite obviously he was not. And then Gothbeard's, you know, sneaking around like a creep. Next time he doesn't answer, if you walk in the room and you're like, hey, is anybody in there and the curtain is closed? Just pull that katana that I know he has off the wall and start stabbing it through the curtain <laughs> just to make sure he's not in there. I'm sure it's got to suck to live with four guys. I mean... Briefly, I lived with four guys in a, in a Navy dorm while they were, I think, painting or something in the actual barracks, but God, that was just a hellish experience. <laughs> I would never go back to that. And doing it for, what is a semester, two, three months? No, no, big no. I was driven insane after only a week of that. And those dudes were like bros, you know, real Navy bros can't imagine being stuffed into a room with basically three complete strangers. And obviously, based on this piece of completely anecdotal evidence, one in four men, totally a creep. <laughs> you stay far away from that dude. Maybe it's one in six, since he did meet the, uh, the gamer bras, sports gamer bra, which isn't really a gamer, but I don't want to sound too much like Gothbeard. <laughs> I can't be seen agreeing with that guy. Come on. Come on! The Caterpillar and the Worm Beard. This is my first ever post on here. Well, welcome, OP. I just discovered a lot of people sharing their neckbeard stories through Reddit and YouTube, so this has been on my mind again lately. 
I've decided to commit my own memory to writing. This is free to share or narrate, which I will. <laughs> I'll try to keep this concise and not too, too long, but you have to understand that I got to know these people for years, so I might not be able to keep it all in one go. For context, the main story occurs throughout the duration of my college experience. I was around two neckbeards who were friends in college. I guess we'll call them the caterpillar and the worm. A little about myself. As I was saying before, I was a sophomore in college, staying in an apartment a short walking distance from campus. The apartments in the area are co-ed since they aren't owned by the campus themselves. They're set up for students or on-campus families that would rather not brave the cramped horror of campus dorms. <laughs> I had a roommate I trusted in freshman year. He was polite, minded his own business, paid bills on time, so when he had to move out for an emergency return home before next semester, I trusted his recommendation. I was a little panicked, wondering if I would find someone else to have the bill with me in time to renew the contract. My old roommate told me to worry not. He had an old friend of his that he knew needed somewhere to stay on campus. I was informed that this fellow was studying the same area as me, fine art, and that he was just as nice and wasn't a creep. New roomie is who I'll call Caterpillar. That was my immediate thought upon meeting him before his sign on to the lease, like the chubby-cheeked little Caterpillar from the Bugs Life movie. I mean this in the most endearing way nowadays. I'm a cute little bumblebee. <laughs> he Heimlich? Yeah. Caterpillar was more of a pseudo neckbeard. I was very skeptical of him, nervous even, thinking, oh god, what have I agreed to? He totally looked the part. Really husky guy, tall, had kind of a whack taste in shoes, long, always wet looking hair and something on his chin struggling to become facial hair. <laughs> I could tell he was a video game fan by the Legend of Zelda shirt stretched over his gut. There was no fedora though, and luckily no nasty smell, just a pair of old fogged and scratched glasses perched upon his nose, and lots of old wrinkled band-aids on his chunky fingers. I told him my name, and he offered me a really awkward handshake. I wonder what OP would think of my taste in shoes, considering that I've worn nothing but flip-flops since moving to the Philippines. <laughs> Despite my skepticism of him, Caterpillar did radiate a sort of laid-back, reserved energy. He kept his hands in his pockets as I showed him where things were in the apartment. He'd offer me a cool, cool, or occasional okay, or an acknowledging nod as I directed him from kitchen to living room to my own closed bedroom door and then to where his own room was. In general, he didn't have much to say aside from this, or his thanks for my assistance and allowing him to stay. The move-in was uneventful, but I could see by the boxes that he brought in from his truck out front that he was absolutely, without a doubt, a video game fan. I love anime and games too, so I further tested his demeanor with questions. I prodded, wanting to know if he was a know-it-all, and of course he was, but again, not in a super neckbeardy way. It was more like the engine that couldn't stop once it got going. Someone who was so quiet just lit up when I told him that I recognized some of the Sega or Nintendo memorabilia that he was lugging box by box into his room. This dude information dumped like a dump truck at the landfill. He went on and on, his gravelly voice carrying exorbitantly across the apartment, even though I'd long left him on his own in his new room. I could see how he and my old roommate could have been friends, so I actually relaxed. He was just a nerd, that's all. <laughs> Nerds might be socially unaware, but yeah, most of them are harmless. So after a few days, Caterpillar settled in. Just like my old roommate, if I wasn't sitting out in the main living areas, Caterpillar didn't bother me, even if I could tell he really wanted to. He was just a closed door sort of person, just like myself, and was totally aware of the concept of personal space thank God. Things remained comfortable, of course, until they didn't. The stress of college can do a lot of things to people. I myself suffer the pre and post midterm messy room, and that's probably double for an artist. But for Caterpillar, this resulted in some irritating behavior. He didn't stink before, but he stunk up the apartment every now and again with neglecting to shower. The funk was the strongest close to his room, but its tendrils slithered through the hall and curled around the corner, attempting to conquer and rule iron-fisted over the entirety of the realm that was our apartment. <laughs> he grows more neckbeardy by the day. 
I am admittedly passive aggressive. I didn't outright tell him that he stunk or that he needed to wash his clothes or that he really needed to do something about the dishes that he used that were stacking up in the sink. Waging war, I would leave his dishes by his door or spray Febreze on the rare occasion that the dark threshold to his beard lair was left ajar. I was really angry with him about this back then because I just cannot stand living in stank. <laughs> Stankonia. But after the midterms were over and we could have our spring break, he actually did draw up the courage to apologize to me. I'll be real with you, OP, he probably would have apologized sooner if you weren't being passive aggressive. Just tell people what you need, no shame in that. But as usual, I understand the pains of being young. <laughs> I was young once. Anyways. <laughs> Hand scratching behind the head, shuffling nervously, as if he were afraid I was going to yell or curse him out. He said something like, I have uh, trouble multitasking sometimes, you know, when there's just so much to do. I think I get depressed or like my energy goes away. I won't let it happen again. I'd hate for you to kick me out. Well, I didn't know what to say after that. I felt sort of bad for considering exactly that come next lease renewal, but come on. He had to pull himself together. Hygiene, keeping a living area clean is a very basic, bare minimum type of thing. I tried to understand whatever it was that he was dealing with, and I gave him another chance. I even offered to motivate him to look after himself when he was stressed out. I actually got around to helping him clean non-super personal stuff up in his room for spring break that year since the onslaught of midterms was over. I cannot begin to explain the magnitude of hot mess that that room was, but he and I sort of bonded a little over filling up those trash bags. It was mostly a chat about video game stuff since that's what decorated a majority of his nerd nest. He told me, thanks for helping him clean up since he probably would have been overwhelmed with it on his own. And then he wondered if I wanted to help him clean up my room after. Now, I'm a little dragon of a lady who fiercely protects her own hoard. I grew up with a very invasive mother who would snoop through and even throw out some of my things while I was at school. I had, and honestly still have, a system of keeping my door closed. Now that I'm an adult, I like to keep it locked to protect my own memorabilia. A millimeter thick of graphite, like the sort you keep in a mechanical pencil, will tell you if someone has opened the door if you place it in a certain area on the hinge. It either makes a mark on the frame or it snaps, a trick that I learned from dealing with my mother. This will make some sense when I come back later, but I declined Caterpillar's offer to help me clean my room. Dragon Lady territory only. And it's booby trapped, just like in the story we read yesterday. So I met and got on good terms with the Caterpillar, but now enters the Worm. Worm was someone who I had seen in passing. He was friends with Caterpillar since they would play Smash Bros or D&D &D in the upper lounge floor of the university cafeteria hall. He was without a doubt a full-fledged, obnoxious, tone-deaf, socially unaware neckbeard. He wasn't as husky as Caterpillar, and not as tall, but they were commonly mistaken for brothers. He didn't wear a fedora, but he was always in a faux leather trench coat that was one size too small. He wore those New Balance shoes with off-white socks, I mean, actually dirty socks, not the brand, cargo pants, and the same few pilling horror t-shirts. It seems like OP is so aware of fashion, which I'm totally not. <laughs> it's an interesting perspective. I was on good terms with Caterpillar, as I said before, and he never made me uncomfortable, so I didn't mind being seen around campus with him. The first time I met Worm, I think he assumed that Caterpillar and I were a thing. I could practically feel him scoping me out, sizing me up with some misplaced envy, even after Caterpillar had informed him that we were just roommates and I was looking for something to do with my downtime on campus. I tried to keep my eyes ahead while Caterpillar and his other friends were playing their match in Brawl, but of course Worm kept trying to get in close to me. I remember vividly just because of the way he smelled. Kind of like a wet dog, but human. <laughs> and fishy, because he always ate sushi from the downstairs cafe on account of being a full-blown weeb. And I know Worm never washed his freaking eel sauce covered fingers. <laughs> a neckbeard and a weeaboo. What unholy abomination have we encountered? <laughs> so, 
Are you a sophomore? Exchange student, madam? Madam? <laughs> oh, madam, you're a lusty old gal, aren't you? Yes, I was a sophomore, but not an exchange student. My college was, and still is, international heavy, so I didn't really see what he was getting at at the time, but I'm ambiguous facially. I've been mistaken for Asian or Latina before, but I'm actually black. You like video games or anime? I told him that I did in fact like video games, but Animal Crossing or Terraria or Kingdom Hearts or Kirby were too casual, not real video games. Worm played manly, deep, intellectual games like Dark Souls and Alan Wake and Resident Evil and Darkwood. Which honestly really are some pretty interesting games, but the way he insulted my own preference and tried to play himself up just really irritated me. I awkwardly laughed though. I didn't want to be rude in front of Caterpillar's friends. We all have that one annoying associate, right? God, he's that guy. People who play strictly games with like a dark aesthetic are just so tryhard. <laughs> You're trying to feel like a grown up man, aren't you? As somebody who plays Animal Crossing, Pokemon, Super Mario, Breath of the Wild, like almost exclusively these days, I'm quite offended. It's just like a giant red flag that this dude does not know how to have a good time. <laughs> Eventually, inevitably, he nudged the conversation into asking if I had any friends who were into the same stuff as all of them. And then of course, the final shove. Do you have a boyfriend? And my stupid ass, my dumb ass answer was no. And I also added that I wasn't interesting in having one at the time since I wanted to stay focused on building my art portfolio. But oof, too late. The hunt was on. The worm had set his sights on the most easily reached succulent little green leaf on the barren girl gamer tree. <laughs> I wish I could have seen it then in his slimy little smirk. Maybe I could have put my guard up earlier. If Caterpillar wasn't going to make any moves, then Worm was going to try his hardest to earn my attention. And try really uncomfortably hard, he did. <laughs> Told you, try hard. It even weirded Caterpillar out a little bit. I assume Worm would probably ask his, his best buddy, his old pal, if OP would be coming to their Smash or D&D meetups, or if I would be coming to their study groups. Even though Worm and Caterpillar and I were completely different artists, they did game design, of course, <laughs> and OP was into painting. Um, he's asking if you're gonna come to the meetup again? He has something for you. I, I don't know. Caterpillar had the cell phone up to his ear. His eyes were large and exasperated. You know that look people make when they're just over it? And they're trying to see if you can tell how over it they are? <laughs> That's the look. Worm did that neckbeard thing where he would just buy me really unnecessary gifts. He bought me a plush of Isabel once and a bell bag full of chocolate coins. That's the one gift I remember the most because it was hard for me not to turn it down. I accepted them. I know, I know, and he took that as a free pass to ask for my number. So I don't have to bother Caterpillar anymore when I have stuff for you, Madam Plush. That was the innuendous nickname that he gave me. Never accept the gift. Never. I mean, OP says she knows she knows, but man, that's a can of worms that you can't put the monkeys back in, you know? <laughs> Now, I'll reiterate, I know I should not have taken the plush or the chocolate, but I really did feel like it would have been rude not to just accept this nice stuff from him. If all he was doing was trying to keep contact with me for little things, then I felt like it would have been okay. I was dumb, and also very wrong. It was the first check and save point for him. The worm was crawling further along the branch to take a bite out of me. It always starts small. It's gonna devolve so quickly. <laughs> Worm texted me all the time. I could feel my phone vibrating in my purse in the middle of my art history lectures. He'd text me late at night, things he thought I would find interesting during one of his shopaholic binges. It was annoying, but the texts were at least normal-ish at that point. 
He'd send me photos of plushies or stickers or cute ball-jointed doll pets. Since my new nerd man friend group knew that I hoarded them in my coveted closed door den. Those were fine to send to me. I guess it was whatever. But there was one night when he actually sent me a screenshot of a different website and asked me my opinion on some sort of kitty themed outfit. I'm very sure that it was lingerie. <laughs> Cat girl lingerie, bro. <laughs> Never in life. Oh, this dude was actually asking me in his own weirdo way if I was interested in lingerie being bought for me. I'm not gonna lie. It was very cute, but there was no way in hell that I was gonna accept this from someone I barely knew who was really, really creeping me out at this point. I told him that, oh, it's really not for me. You don't have to buy me anything. Just keep your money for final supplies, dude. He wasn't getting my hint that I didn't want to be enticed with lingerie. He kept sending me different styles, asking if this or that was cute or if I was a more sophisticated madam that preferred less silly designs. He even told me about things that he thought I would look good in. And I replied with, I'm good with nothing. Seriously, this is a little bit weird, lol. And he gave me an, oh, okay, sorry. But that only stopped Worm for a short while. It only gradually escalated from there, but this is getting really long, so I'll have to add on later if anyone would like me to. Over summer break, he started spending time at Caterpillar's place and subsequently my place. And it almost made me consider completely moving out. Thanks if you stop by and read, and I apologize for any misses in Reddit etiquette or spelling mistakes. Until next time. And to think it all started with a plushy toy or whatever. <laughs> like OP, you kind of opened the door to all this stuff, you know? He took your acceptance of his gift as a sign that it was okay for him to make advances. And so the advances got a little bit creepier and creepier each time. And at no point did you pump the brakes and say, Hey, look, dude, I don't like this. <laughs> Sometimes you have to be extremely forward, especially with people who don't necessarily recognize signs and social etiquette. Obviously, like Worm doesn't. The second he tried to present me with some lingerie, I'd make him explain himself. Be like, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen with this? I don't like it. Now, I'm not saying that Worm had any right to try and literally worm his way into OP's life or anything like that, but you gotta stop the advance. Just nip it in the bud, and then you probably won't have to worry about it at all. Luckily, it seems like Worm has Caterpillar around to keep him on the straight and narrow, but if Worm is ever at your house alone with you, vacate the house <laughs> as quickly as possible, because this dude is giving off major creep vibes, and that's definitely not something that you just want to be like, oh, uh, I guess I'll put up with it, and maybe it'll change. It's not gonna change. You need to push back, and I say that with all the love in the world. So, good luck, OP. I know you can do it, and of course, thank you for sharing your story. I hope that you will add to this one quite soon, and I'd be happy to read that on the channel. Last time on Waifu's Most Wanted. A brief history of PB, the Coom Lord. Oh my god, I'm cooming. <laughs> Reading all your stories has made me revisit old memories. For better or for worse, I suppose. I was a cringy nerd in middle school. I moved around every two to four years because I was a military dependent, and this left me desperate for friends and acceptance, so I always bonded with those easiest to infiltrate. Outcasts, weirdos, edgelords, neckbeards, etc. You know the groups. I met some amazing friends I still have now this way, but we're all here for the weird shit. <laughs> you damn right. The first main neckbeard that stands out in my mind is PB. P-beard? <laughs> we met when I returned from living overseas to attend college in the Midwest. I was staying in a rural town with my aunt and uncle and cousins for the summer until dorms opened, and my closest cousin introduced me to their neighbor a few miles away. Happy to know someone my own age, I worked hard to gain entry into the new friend group. Though they were burnouts, it was still nice to be accepted. Peabeard's appearance was, I guess, average for a 17 to 19 year old. I was a year or two older, but not wise enough to avoid eventually dating him, always in some kind of stained and raggedy Marvel PJ pants or old band or video game or anime shirt. 
he didn't dress or maintain himself well. Only showering every two to four days, it was still a mystery to me how his hair was always still noticeably greasy. He had bad skin. Peabeard was nice but emotionally manipulative and very talented at guitar. I fell prey to his suave musical charms and how much of a self-made man he was, living in his parents' remodeled shop slash apartment for free and working for his dad a few days a week. He had zero aspirations. I think he was betting on being famous. And for a time, it was a refreshing change of pace for me. <laughs> uh, to be young again. All-nighters playing video games and watching shit movies. My first time ever playing Fallout 4 New Vegas was here. Truth is, the game was rigged from the start. We skinny dipped in a river in August. It wasn't all bad. There are some fun memories. Curiously, he wasn't an anime maniac and didn't have a waifu. It's just a reverence for old Toonami stuff that we both grew up on. His family accepted and adored me, the polite overachiever, and made it clear that I was always welcome. But <sighs> Peabeard was a pig. Well, maybe it's Pigbeard. I'm gonna stick with Peabeard. <laughs> As the main hangout spot for four to five nerds slash girlfriends slash friends of friends, you can imagine that the place became dirty pretty fast. There were bugs, you couldn't walk barefoot because of all of the dirt and grime, and Peabeard thought it was funny to mix old foods in his fridge and leave it as a science experiment to grow. Guess who would eventually clean it all? Yeah. I spent so much time there that I would clean for them like a little French maid. Sometimes the guys would feel guilty and help for a bit. Grizz, an oversized regular, would help me when he was around. He had a crush on me, of course. Some of them called me mom, even though we were the same age. Come on, make me want to be your mom! Peabeard had the worst luck with girls. And it's because he would fixate on one perfect, skinny, talented dancer that he dated in high school. Because he had it once, he obviously always deserved girls of this caliber, and didn't understand why they wouldn't stay with him long term. <laughs> I'm remembering the briefest hint of possible statutory rape drama. I think her dad threatened to report him if he didn't stop seeing her, so... Not a good look. Dude, I'm sorry the love of your life didn't want to get married and live in your parents... <laughs> and live in your parents' converted garage at 15. Get over it. <sighs> but yes... Peabeard and I eventually dated. I want to say for around four to six months. I recall being disgusted enough with his bed, a full size, that I brought my own pillow over. His was a different color where his head would rest. Oh god. <laughs> Remember when I said he was greasy? His bed, pillows, sheets, comforter, all bad. Dirty. But his pillows were the worst. Saturated and dirty enough that it didn't matter how much you washed them, the oil discoloration just wouldn't come out. <laughs> like parking a leaky car on a driveway. <laughs> Sometimes I would wake up with bug bites on me. Oof, I don't think it was bed bugs because it never followed me to the dorms, but who knows? It was gross, and I don't know why I put up with it. It was scabies, bruh. <laughs> well, he didn't have any fingerless gloves. He did wear the occasional fedora. He was an accomplished gate guard of media, and a favorite hobby of his was shit-talking other people's tastes in, well, anything. But especially music, to the point of insulting their intelligence. He always knew more and knew better and was happy to say so. He was the kind of arguer that would only stop when you called his shit. One of the friends I met through Peabeard was Grizz, who we'll be talking about later in this video. Bedroom activities were average, not really remarkable, except for one instance that has been seared into my brain. I can't remember most of my childhood or adolescence, but oh, I remember this. Fooling around alone in my dorm, I was going down on him. He'd come on his stomach, and I, ever the dedicated seductress, bent down to lick it clean. He'd try hesitantly to stop me with a half-hearted, You don't have to do that. But I can't help but feel that he knew. He knew what was about to happen. I do my thing, and it's fine for the briefest of moments, but something isn't right. 
the consistency is wrong. But nobody likes a quitter, and I didn't want to hurt his feelings. <laughs> Going for gold, OP. It was lumpy. His coom was lumpy? Jesus. Parts seemed older and more congealed than others, like clotting blood or spoiled milk globs. Oh, God. Uh, I'm struggling to describe this, but even with a strong stomach, I wanted to gag and spit it all back out. It was fucking gross, and I never did it again with him after that. I've also not encountered it since. We didn't talk about the incident, though I'm sure he knew what had happened. I gave him shit about his diet after this. Oh, I didn't mention yet, but you already know. Soda and fast food, with the odd meal with his mom and dad, was all that he ate. He grew bored the longer I was in college until it got to the point that he made no effort to see me at all. We didn't have any dates besides him occasionally paying for me at a nicer place than Taco Bell or McDonald's. I think he took me to Chick-fil-A once. <laughs> I was okay with that, but mostly... It did suck. <laughs> this dude sucks all around. Eventually, he broke up with me over text because he'd started talking to a girl who was still in high school and decided that she was the one for him. It sucked being the one broken up with, but whatever. <laughs> At least you escaped. I was ecstatic to hear that she later had zero interest in him and rejected every advance. It's ten years later, and he's still in the same spot, but... I think somewhat more self-aware, living with an ex-girlfriend in a weird limbo situation for some reason. Anyways, part two will focus on Grizz, if there's interest. Thanks for sticking around and reading. I know exactly what happened, OP. I know why it was chunky. It had nothing to do with his diet, okay? I think he just uh, is used to shooting it on himself and just leaving it there to dry. So what you had was... Probably the crumblies of past cooms mixed with the new coom. <laughs> God. <laughs> it's like, bro, it's not that hard after you finish watching your, your little anime porno session to just mop it up with a sock or whatever, dude. <laughs> You're not going to do any harm to your pillows or bed sheets. Just, just go for that. Like, why would you just leave it on yourself? Oh, God. I feel so bad for OP. She went all in, you know, she was trying to go hard with this dude who, like, he's not worth going hard for. What the hell? But like I said at the beginning, ah, uh, to be young again. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, it also really gets me that, you know, she was the one to get broken up with, but, like, in the end, that doesn't really matter. <laughs> at least you got out of the situation one way or the other, because this was going nowhere fast. Super sad to read that, you know, he's 30 and basically still in the same spot, but like you said, zero aspirations. I mean, at some point, maybe he'll go from like neckbeard to full incel and just <laughs> stop harassing women at that point. But man, there's there's nothing on offer here. I, I can't see why any woman would ever interact with him. God, the description is just horrible. I can't get it out of my mind. We might need some eye bleach at the end of this episode. <laughs> this is... Uh, I don't know if I can hang. All right, one more story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it for one more story, and then I'm going to get out of here. After a bit of eye bleach as well. A brief history of Grizz, the bearded revengeancer. Last time on Waifu's Most Wanted. One, a brief history of Peabeard, the Coom Lord. Peabeard, 19-ish, lives in parents' converted garage, Human grunge version of, anyway, here's Wonderwall. <laughs> Grizz, 21. Mutual friend with a long-standing crush on me. Would treat me better than any other guy ever. Yep, totally. And now, for our feature presentation, Grizz. Gather round, plague rats. I'm about to share with you the legend of Grizz. Protector of maidens, and destroyer of curly fries. A regular visitor to the den of dirtiness, <laughs> Grizz was a big guy. Big, big guy. When we met around 2009, he was pushing 325 to 350. 
By the end of our friendship, several years later, it was over 400 pounds, 181.4 kilos, 28.5 stone, if you will. As a self-styled Andre the Giant, he was obviously a strong man that just so happened to be trapped in a morbidly obese man's body. Tragic. Probably some kind of glandular wizard curse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't normally care about someone's weight, I did not enjoy watching his slow suicide over the course of our friendship, and his physical characteristics are relevant to this story. Dang, <laughs> got a lot sadder when you put it like that. With his imposing 5'10 figure as wide as it was tall, it was important to Grizz to maintain a teddy bear attitude so that he didn't scare the frail woman folk with his immense size and strength. He was always careful to keep his power level under 10% output, so that nobody would accidentally be snapped in half or eviscerated. <laughs> this was an important part of how he viewed himself. Strong, intimidating, ferocious, dangerous when provoked, etc. While he wasn't quite in all ways except physical, I am a wolf bad, he did have a bit of that attitude. Offering to protect me and punish any man who might offend me was a common occurrence when sharing my troubles. Obviously, I would have never survived in the real world without knowing that I had him to protect me. <laughs> like I had a bunch of family around or anything. So, the good knight Grizz admittedly was strong. I'll give him that. But you had to be to get around with his size. His strength was not the result of any kind of weight training that I'm aware of. He was simply blessed with it from birth by Odin or Hulk Hogan. <laughs> On one occasion, I had to literally scold him like a child for trying to lift my car in a show of strength because surely that would impress me and make me date him. <laughs> I flipped your car over to date me. <laughs> The area he was grabbing on my car was all plastic and would have easily been damaged, so although the car did lift a bit, I nipped that exposition before he could make his point. This was likely on a late night outing to town after having a few drinks at Peabeard's place. I was usually designated driver because, you know, I didn't want to fucking die. <laughs> Grizz and Peabeard had a duplicitous and competitive relationship. In a town that small, your friend selection is slim, and oftentimes you might feel forced to keep people in your life that you don't like just because it's better than being alone. In this way, they would chronically complain about each other to anybody who would listen. Peabeard would complain about his size, and Grizz would rip on Peabeard for being emo. Ironically, they each complained about the other's hygiene, herder. <laughs> they were both abnormally musically talented, doing both acoustic guitar and vocals, some messy drums added in post, and they recorded some okay songs together. Not bangers, but they did sound nice. If you were very quiet, you could hear them trying to outsing and outplay the other. Just kidding, that was like the unintended main feature of their music. Whenever one of them was on a roll, the other one would pipe up with a yeah or hmm. <laughs> to take the attention back when it wasn't planned in the lyrics. <laughs> Think Kings of Leon and Never Shout Never style. Mentally torturing himself, Grizz had an ongoing inferiority complex centering around grungy Peabeard. In his eyes, Peabeard got all the girls and treated them like shit. Peabeard was more attractive, see average, had a private living area, and didn't have to work. Grizz had far less romantically interested parties, and had to work many times harder to keep them. This sadly caused him to stay with a few toxic women while I knew him. I will not deny that he was a good listener, and a kind friend, a proud fedora owner, and anime slash game enthusiast. He did grow out of the fedoras over time. Because he got fat? <laughs> Sorry. Sadly, his interest in my life was not wholly altruistic intent, but because he imagined I would eventually succumb to his masculine pheromones. Ooh. <laughs> he was always in the same short sleeve plaid button-up and cargo shorts. I imagine partially because clothes shopping was a chore. Understandable. I mean, I don't fault him for that. 
While the others claimed he had a smell, his hygiene seemed fine, but a bit musty to me at this time, where Peabeard was a bit more socially normal. <laughs> Sad boy and Gurr impersonator, raw enthusiast, chaser of jailbait, Grizz was just that little bit extra neck beardy. Spike from Cowboy Bebop was his inspiration. He was both a neckbeard and a nice guy at the same time, set on doing gentlemanly acts that, although appreciated, were to me just basic manners. Yes, he did have a literal neckbeard. Most of the time that I knew him, he had a messy beard and mustache. I presume to disguise his weight, much like I wear pants, to disguise the pale mood of my butt from enraging werewolves. Things were fine in our relationship and group dynamic, at least for a time. I'm just going to interject and say he seems more white knight than nice guy to me, because nice guys usually have the little abusive flip once they're rejected, you know? This guy's like white knight through and through. Anyways, a while after Peabeard and I separated, I didn't see the group. I wanted space to lick my wounds and regain some self-confidence after being dumped by someone that I at least partially viewed as a loser. Loser! You're a loser! Awkwardness aside, while I wasn't welcomed back into the fold as before, they would tell me if they were coming to town or invite me to hang once in a while. Pity, maybe? Was I now a token pair of tits to them? I don't know. It was better than typing papers, at least. Peabeard would sulk and do real sad boy hours when I was around. You can imagine my surprise when one of the guys contacts me privately to ask if the rumor was true. Rumor? What rumor? The rumor that I had slept with Grizz. I laughed it off, but corrected him sternly. No, I did not sleep with Grizz. I am not remotely attracted to Grizz. Where did you hear this? You see where this is going, right? I guess Grizz thought that he could get some cool points with the boys by lying about my sexual promiscuity. Maybe he was feeling left out? I don't know. The fucker had to have known that I would find out eventually. So I confronted him, he admitted to lying, and apologized. Groveled a little bit. The part that irked me is that not long before, I had helped him to get petty revenge on his ex by going with him to pick up his things and acting like we were a couple. It was clear that this was just done as a favor. I did him a solid and this is how he repaid me? Oh, he was a nice guy after all. <laughs> After that settled down, I was preparing to move again to a different state to continue college. Grizz seemed desperate to spend time with me before I left, and we'd texted frequently. I don't remember how it came into the conversation, but we were both interested in BDSM. Dropping me off at the place I was staying after a friendly lunch, he offered to dom for me. So I could de-stress. I don't blame him for trying, I guess, but I was obviously not interested at all. I declined and blamed a recent breakup instead of the truth, which was being disgusted just by the thought. I've never liked confrontation, and I see now how the answer could have been interpreted as maybe another time. Over the next few years, he delved into polyamory with his new long-term girlfriend, often complaining to me about how she always had more attention from partners than he did. More than once, he complained to me about being stood up or ghosted by prospective subs. How everything was going perfect, and nudes were sent, and texts were steamy, right up until they met in person. <laughs> I should have been honest and called him out on his catfishing. I'd seen his profile. All MySpace angles. I've got the MySpace angle going on right here. And photos of the chin and up only. I compromised and helped him rewrite his dating profile with a bit more emphasis on his, uh, size. <laughs> Our friendship came to an end two years ago when he got drunk and confessed his love for me, begging me not to tell my husband or his girlfriend I was his one that got away. It just didn't sit right with me, and I explained that it was wrong. Told my husband, too. I blocked Grizz after that, and I have not regretted it. I racked my brain tonight for anything else that I can remember, but what I haven't covered is mostly his health problems and neckbeard nest slash lifestyle. Anyways, thanks for sticking it out again with me. Happy quarantine, everybody. And luckily, no lumps this time. <laughs> Thank God for that. Whew, well, at least that second story wasn't as bad as the first one. <laughs> My God, 
I don't know how anything could be. But uh, enjoy some eye bleach. Here we go. Oh, soothing. Yes. <laughs> I gotta feel kind of bad for Grizz in the end, you know. He's just kind of like a lost little puppy dog, maybe. I mean, not little. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> he seemed relatively harmless up until the end there, where he's like, you know, lying about sleeping with people, which that's never cool to do. What is wrong with you and your brain? But he didn't get as rapey as some of the other neckbeards that we've seen around, so I guess, I guess I have to be thankful for that. <laughs> I think it's cool that he was able to uh, find connections with people based on his music and stuff. You know, he's not like a forever alone neckbeard. He was at least able to have some relationships and stuff like that, even if they weren't, you know, as often or whatever as he wanted. I think the real lesson here is just, just be grateful for where you're at. Be thankful for what you got, you know what I mean? And on top of the rest of that, just, just stay honest. Like, you... <laughs> You can't go out and catfish people and be like, oh, they. it turns out they weren't interested in me at all because I'm fat. Well, yeah, dude. If you just told them that you're fat, then, you know, your profile pic will do the work for you. <laughs> some chicks are into big boys and some aren't. And that's okay. Let them filter themselves out. You know what I mean? Uh, I've been catfished a few times, though. I get it. You know, everybody wants to feel wanted, but uh, that doesn't make it right. Fucking mall rats, bro. <laughs> My neckbeard roommate became smitten with Zero Suit Samus. <laughs> smitten. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of neckbeard stories on YouTube recently, specifically Red X. Wow, thanks, dude. And it inspired me to share my story. This is the story of a roommate I had in my senior year of college. He was randomly assigned to me. I did not choose to live with this man. I did not have good luck with college roommates. See my previous post, Kevin, my college roommate. This man, however, was no Kevin. He was an almighty neckbeard. I know many people give the neckbeards in their stories creative names, but I can't think of anything good, so I'll just call him Michael because, uh, that was his name. <laughs> he and I lived in a dorm apartment with two other people. We had four single rooms, so while I can say Michael was my roommate, he and I, luckily didn't actually sleep in the same room. Thank God for small miracles. <laughs> Michael was about 5 foot 10 and fat. If I had to guess, I'd say he weighed maybe 250 pounds. He had short black hair, which he cut himself with a pair of clippers that he bought at Walmart. He did have a beard, but it wasn't really a neck beard. Michael's hygiene was fine, I guess. I have nothing really positive or negative to say about it. And I shaved my head too. It's the best way to cut costs. <laughs> Michael spent most of his day in his room. He left our apartment to go to class or to get food. But besides that, he mostly stayed locked in his room. He spent almost all of his free time playing video games in his room, specifically WoW, Call of Duty, and Super Smash Brothers, which I will discuss in a minute. He always wore the same outfit, sweatpants, an anime or video game t-shirt, and grubby sneakers. I never saw him wear a fedora, unfortunately. Michael's diet consisted mainly of Monster Energy, Coca-Cola, Doritos, and fast food. He did enjoy Mountain Dew, because of course, but his main beverages were Monster and Coke. God, wearing sweatpants all the time? That's, <laughs> that's like the maximum level of not give a fuckery. <laughs> Many neckbeards like to think of themselves as really smart. But Michael genuinely was very intelligent. He was studying electrical engineering, and he had a high GPA too. I think it was around a 3.7 or a 3.8. Electrical engineering is generally considered the hardest discipline of engineering, which is already a very difficult field. He wouldn't be able to do well in a field such as that if he weren't legitimately smart. I rarely ever saw Michael do schoolwork though. I'm guessing he did it late at night when I was asleep. Well, smart guy, decent hygiene, aside from his diet and uh, lack of fashion, I'm not seeing too much wrong with this so far. The story that best captures Michael's neck beardery, here we go, <laughs> involved his interest in Super Smash Bros. All four of us liked to play Super Smash Bros. Brawl together on Michael's Wii in our living room, but Michael was constantly asking us to play with him. You see, Michael was obsessed, and I mean obsessed with Zero Suit Samus, ZSS for short. If you aren't familiar, 
Samus is the protagonist of Nintendo's Metroid series. She usually wears a suit of power armor, but when she takes the armor off, she's just wearing a skin-tight bodysuit, and that version is called Zero Suit Samus. Samus is a very attractive individual, and the Zero Suit definitely shows off her body, much to Michael's enjoyment. Michael always played as her when we played Super Smash Bros. Michael often talked about how she was INCREDIBLY SEXY, and how he JUST WISHES THAT HE COULD HAVE A GIRLFRIEND LIKE HER. <laughs> Good luck, buddy. I want an intergalactic bounty hunter for a girlfriend. <laughs> that was truly Michael's goal. To have a girlfriend that looked like Samus. He made a Tinder account for that exact purpose. The issue was that he only swiped right on girls who looked like Samus. That is tall, blonde girls with athletic bodies. These girls, however, obviously were not interested in a neckbeard like Michael. Michael also went to parties to pick up girls. The same issue existed there though. He was only interested in girls who looked like Samus. These girls were certainly not interested in Michael. I'm sure Michael could have gotten a girlfriend, but he was only interested in a very specific faction of very attractive women, so his romantic prospects went unreciprocated. When we played Super Smash Bros, Michael would sit there drooling, I mean literally drooling, as in with his mouth hanging open and saliva slowly meandering down his Dorito crusted lips and off his chubby chin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a horrible image. Michael could be very good at Smash Bros when he actually tried, but he spent as much time gawking at Samus' ass as he did actually playing the game. Naturally, when Smash Ultimate was set to be released in December of that year, Michael was extremely excited. We were all excited, but while the other three of us were excited to play a new and interesting game, Michael was excited to drool over Samus in new and improved high definition. <laughs> On release day, all four of us went to the mall to get the game, since Michael had it pre-ordered at GameStop. I don't remember anything particularly memorable happening on the trip itself. What I do remember was Michael's car. The inside was full of monster and coke cans, empty Dorito bags, and empty fast food containers. This garbage heap was particularly bad on the floor in front of the front passenger seat, which is where I sat. Michael's detritus crunched and crinkled under my feet as I sat there on the way to the mall. I remember trying to push the cans and wrappers out of the way during our drive, and by the time we got to the mall, I'd managed to clear a space of bare floor to put my feet on. Yeah, but at that point, like, your legs are surrounded by trash, aren't they? <laughs> I'll put my feet on top of the trash, I don't need all that. When we got back, we of course spent the rest of the afternoon playing Smash Ultimate. Nice. In the absence of his beloved Samus, Michael played as Link. Did Michael just have a thing for blondes? We may never know. To Michael's great arousal, and my great distress, <laughs> one of the characters we unlocked later that afternoon was Zero Suit Samus. When the A NEW FOE HAS APPEARED screen came up, Michael immediately recognized the outline of Zero Suit Samus. He blurted out, OH YEAH! which sounded something between an excited outburst and an aroused moan. <laughs> Michael's wet dream had come true. While Smash Bros. Brawl Zero Suit Samus had always worn a skin-tight bodysuit, in Smash Ultimate they included her casual outfit as an option. This was basically just a sports bra and booty shorts, and this pleased Michael's thirsty fantasies. <laughs> Reunited with his lady love, Michael happily spent the next two hours or so playing as Zero Suit Samus in the casual outfit until we stopped for the day. That night, at about midnight, I left my room to go to the bathroom. As I approached the living room, I could see that the TV was turned on. This was weird, I thought, but it only got worse, though. When I got close enough to see around the corner, I could see that the TV had Smash Ultimate on it. It was set to training mode, and Samus was standing there in her casual outfit. As I rounded the corner... I saw him. Michael was on the couch, across from the TV, with his hand down the front of his sweatpants, making an unmistakable up and down motion. <laughs> oh. At that point, I was still enough behind him that Michael hadn't seen me, so I just silently backed up and went back to my room. My mind struggled to comprehend what I had just witnessed. 
here was this grown man sitting in the living room at midnight, jerking his gherkin to Zero Suit Samus. <laughs> I knew he was infatuated with her, but good lord. Instead of, you know, going online and looking up Rule 34 of Samus and diddling his doodle in his room like a normal person, <laughs> Michael had chosen to do it to a video game in the middle of the living room while everyone else was asleep. Oh, let's see. Uh, oh, Laura, no panties. You know I liked it like that. I never told anyone what I had witnessed that fateful night. In fact, this is the first I have spoken of it since it happened. The rest of the year, thankfully, passed relatively uneventfully. Michael spent most of his time in his room, at the engineering building, or playing Smash Bros while drooling over Samus. He still ate mostly Doritos and fast food, but that was just the standard for Michael. There was nothing out of the ordinary for him there. The following May, Michael and I graduated. He got his degree in electrical engineering and got a job designing the control systems for industrial machines. I never saw Michael after we graduated, but the memory of him will last a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that I relate to any of this because when I play Smash Bros Ultimate, my mains are either heavies or not human. <laughs> I mean like Bowser, K. Rule, and Rob. Sometimes Mega Man if I'm feeling trolly. But I can't help but think that Michael would be so much better at the game, he could be like competition level if he would just play a character that he wasn't constantly drooling over. <laughs> it's so sad at the end of the day though. He didn't want any other Zero Suit Samus, some random drawing from the internet. He wanted that particular Zero Suit Samus. None other would do. <laughs> or else he'd feel like he's cheating. <laughs> oh, Michael. I hope you get it figured out one day, buddy. <laughs> That's just like the saddest story I've ever read. These unrealistic body standard expectations that are set forth by a video game. And he just can't get over it. Maybe he'll get rich, maybe he will find that woman of his dreams, but man, don't don't ever jerk off to a video game. <laughs> I'm not gonna kink shame you or anything, but like, Rule 34 exists for a reason, you know what I'm saying? This kind of reminds me of what happened with this one kid in junior high school, I think I was in 8th grade, and I got the Bloodhound Gang Hooray for Boobies CD, it just came out, and uh, that probably shows some of my age, but... <laughs> I showed I showed the CD to my friend Joe and he's like oh cool can I borrow it and I'm like sure dude and not 20 minutes later lunch wasn't even over <laughs> I got told that Joe was jerking off to that CD in the bathroom not even in the stall in the bathroom like he's standing at the urinal looking at the CD and making a motion that it's pretty obvious what he's doing <laughs> oh <laughs> So did I let him keep the CD? Did I burn it later? Hell no, dude. That was 15 bucks. I loved that CD. <laughs> I just tried not to think about what it had seen. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was a young kid. This is like a fully grown man. God, that is horrifying. I'm so sorry you had to witness that OP, but <laughs> god damn. Thank you so much for sharing. That cracks me up. Maybe the funniest story I read all week. <laughs> So good. Ah, uh, let's get into another one. <laughs> I hope it's half as good as this one. <laughs> let's check it out. Zombie Beard. I've been a lurker on this sub for a few months, and I feel the need to share my experience with a beard cell that for the remainder of this post shall henceforth be known as Zombie Beard. No, sorry for any bad paragraph breaks. I am on mobile. Beard cell. A bearded incel. All right, then. Now it's been a few years since I was in contact with Zombie Beard. These interactions occurred between 2011 and early 2014. I met Zombie Beard through the guy that I was dating at the time. That should have been your first sign, OP, birds of a feather. Mm-mm, don't do it. That would have been the breakup moment for me. <laughs> Due to the extended period of time, here's basically a time-lapse overview of this... Well, I called him a sexist, bigoted, racist, narcissistic asshole to his face on more than one occasion, so let's just go with that. 1. Zombie Beard was obsessed with Rob Zombie, hence the name. When I say obsessed, I mean this guy only wore threadbare band t-shirts. 
His walls were covered in album art and movie posters, and his apartment was very small. He knew every lyric to every song, every album, and every line from every movie. At the time, Rob Zombie's wife had a clothing line that was advertising the release of these $200 shoes that Zombie Beard desperately wanted, and he was trying to talk various people into getting them for him. Shut up and take my money! Ask Santa real nice. <laughs> Two, Zombie Beard lived off of social security and disability because he had crippling anxiety that made it impossible for him to handle being around others for extended periods of time. Yet Zombie Beard would still make my ex drive him to the mall to wander around for hours on end. Fucking mall rats, bro. <laughs> he also got Section 8 housing as well as welfare and food stamps, and he'd just blow his food stamps on Fago. Yes, he was a juggalo and also cheap frozen TV dinners and junk food. He'd pig out on his haul, and then he'd cry to his mother, who was also on social security and disability, about how he was hungry. And if she didn't give him some of her groceries, he'd tell his grandma how mean his mom was being. And grandma would shame his mom into giving him food. By the way, he was 30 at this point. God, <laughs> that's the saddest part of the story. 30, bro? Get it together. 3. He was addicted to porn. He could name off not only porn stars' industry names, but their actual names as well. He'd bring it up in casual conversation like he was discussing the latest Marvel movie. It'd start with talking about directors and lighting and the soundtrack to start, but eventually it would always turn into, Oh, X has such great tits! and quickly degrade into disgusting remarks about the women. But he'd always play it off, saying, These actresses deserve as much notoriety as mainstream ones. It's shameful how they get looked down on because of the nature of the film. I love how he tries to make it seem like high class. He's like, ooh, I'm a porno connoisseur. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Four, he was a racist bigot. His one and only girlfriend cheated on him with a black guy. And according to my ex, it dialed up the racism in this guy from a 5 to a 9. One night, my ex and Zombie Beard were out with a mutual female friend who we'll call Emily. Emily was talking to a random guy at the bar and enjoying the conversation when Zombie Beard came up to her and dragged her off of the bar stool and tried to take her back to the table that they were at. Emily shook him loose and demanded to know what his problem was. And Zombie Beard replied, he wasn't gonna lose another girlfriend to no fucking... We don't say that word. <laughs> Emily slapped him and yelled that not only was she not his girlfriend, she didn't want to be friends with a racist. She left, but ended up talking to him again eventually because my ex remained friends with both of them and she didn't want to make things more awkward. I don't want to be friends with a racist, but I will anyways. <laughs> what? Zombie guy nice guyed the hell out of Emily. He'd spend his $200 welfare check on her for her birthday, getting her a surprise hair and nail appointment along with a dozen roses and a giant box of chocolate. Simp! <laughs> then he'd rant and moan about how she ended up dating another mutual friend who was an electrician and how he was wrong for her because he obviously can't maintain a healthy relationship because he has a kid already. I remember we were in my car with my ex in the front Zombie Beard and Emily in the back, and Give Me That Girl by Joe Nichols came on the radio, and Zombie Beard told Emily how the song reminded him of her, and she asked me to change the station. <laughs> got him. <laughs> Zombie Beard got super defensive about how it wasn't in a romantic way, it was just the lyrics fit her personality. Last I heard, Emily had gotten married and had a kid with someone that she met in AA, so... Hopefully she was able to cut him out of her life even more. Give me that girl. Yeah, boy. Six. At one point, Zombie Beard began talking to a woman in Alabama who desperately wanted him to move down with her and her daughter and be a family. He thought he'd hit the jackpot of some southern belle who'd cook and clean and, ugh, service him whenever. What he got was a leg beard who had catfished him. <laughs> Apparently, the pictures that she sent were her cousin, who was half her size, and she expected him to get a job and help around the house and care for her five-year-old. She'd berate him about his lack of hygiene and work ethic. 
though it was highly likely that this was a situation of the pot calling the kettle black. 7. His nest, I mean apartment. The apartment was a large room for the living room slash bedroom. I guess the idea was to encourage people to get futons, a kitchen, and a commercial style bathroom. The only lived in portion of the, again, small space was a recliner and a ratty mattress with balled up pillows and blankets. That's sad. I was only there once after he had left for Alabama. He asked his mom, who had in turn asked for help due to her disability, to clean out the leftover food and tidy up a bit. He of course asked a week after he had left. Jesus. <laughs> the smell of this place was nearly indescribable, but I'll do my best. Trigger warning, here it is. <laughs> the first thing you smelled was unwashed jockstrap, followed by crusty jizz sock with wafts of rotting food throughout. <laughs> Nutty. <laughs> The only thing in his fridge was a salad kit he had bought a week and a half earlier when he had forced my ex to cut our hiking trip short to take him shopping. The pile of dirty laundry next to the recliner looked like it should have had some demented Jim Henson Muppet reject pop out of it at any second. Down at Fraggle Rock. <laughs> it stank and had clearly been used as napkins and uh, cleanup rags after enjoying his favorite film genre. The toilet should have been collected as biohazardous waste because that's what it was covered in. Yes, dear friends, Zombie Beard refused to waste money on toilet paper. Oh, God. So he'd just pull up his pants after and continue on with his day. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, and he hated underwear. So your boy went commando. Jesus. And he can't even be bothered to wash his shit-smeared jeans. <laughs> <laughs> the only clean fixtures in the apartment were the kitchen, because he only used the microwave, and the shower, because who needs soap and water when you have Axe body spray? Oh, zombie beard. What a mess you are. <laughs> Eight, as stated before, zombie beard was very sexist. I work in the food and hospitality industry, and when he found this out, he nudged my ex and chuckled. So long as she doesn't neglect the kitchen at home. <laughs> Another truly shining moment of his horrific ideals is when he got into an argument with the mother of my ex's child on why no woman would date him. And he shot back with, You aren't the type of woman a guy ever shows off in public. I'm sure you look a lot better on your knees, being in the bedroom or the kitchen. My ex then punched him in the jaw and threw him out. Three months later, Zombie Beard apologized to my ex, not the mother of his kids, my ex, and they started hanging out again. 9. He was also homophobic. His dad came out when Zombie Beard was in middle school and divorced his mom. Zombie Beard got teased mercilessly, and instead of channeling his anger at the bullies, he directed it towards gay men. Lesbians were okay, especially in porn, but homosexual men were called every slur imaginable. He'd even call his dad those things and throw the fact that he abandoned him and his brother in his dad's face anytime his dad wouldn't do or buy whatever he wanted. 10. He racked up tens of thousands of dollars in debt and got mad at my ex for telling his creditors where he was. <laughs> Zombie Beard got a partial ride scholarship to the local college for his dream job, but instead of using the money for textbooks, class applications, or anything else that it was intended for, he bought movie tickets, clothes, CDs, and rounds at the bar. <laughs> what an idiot. Then when time came to sign up for classes, he needed to take out a loan. But he ended up not going to class because no one would be his taxi. And from class, he refused to ride the bus with insert racist slur for various non-white groups here. When he had signed the loan, he put my ex down as a person who would know his whereabouts should he try to skip out on repayment without the ex's knowledge. So when the creditor started calling, he was more than happy to give them Zombie Beard's home address. He also took out a Kohl's credit card and maxed it out and refused to pay anything on it. <laughs> 11. He never learned to drive and expected various friends to be at his beck and call for wherever he needed to go. Be it the mall or grocery shopping or just to drive around because he was bored. Oh, what a scumbag. Are you pitching in for gas? You know he ain't pitching in for gas. And if the first friend didn't, he'd talk shit on them to another mutual friend and stir up drama. 
He destroyed my ex's friendship with his best friend for two years in this way. That's all I can remember for now, and I haven't spoken to Zombie Beard or my ex in many years, and I hope to keep it that way. <laughs> what an absolute disaster of a human being. I'm sure there's something in his past that explains this behavior, but in the end, it's like you should be able to get over it and realize that you're destroying your life for absolutely no reason. You're not respecting yourself or your things or anybody else or their things. It's like you just have disdain for everything in the world. And so he's probably going to end up alone at the end of the day. I think the whole thing about him talking shit to people in his friend group about other friends points out exactly what kind of person he is. Never hang around with somebody who's talking shit about other people because guess what? They probably talk shit about you when you're not around. So just leave him alone to rot in his filth. Eventually he'll figure it out or not, you know? And whether he does or he doesn't, he has basically reaped what he sowed. I mean, I'm sorry you had to even associate with this person, OP. Luckily it was a kind of friend of a friend or friend of a boyfriend, rather, situation, but it's really unfortunate either way. I would not want to be around this person at all. Luckily, it is your ex, and I'm sure he had his own reasons to associate with Zombie Beard, but always remember, birds of a feather, if you meet your significant other's friends, just know that your significant other is probably similar to those people in more than one way. With that said, I would have met this guy once and walked away from my boyfriend immediately. I can't stop you from hanging out with him, but I don't have to hang out with either of you, so bye. Probably the part that makes me more sad than any other I mean, aside from, you know, his age and just not being able to get it together is the fact that he almost got it together. He was going to start in college. He got a, a partial ride scholarship, you know, and then he just like threw it out the window. He's like, I'd rather buy some clothes and CDs. Yeah, I'm sure that's going to last longer than a fucking degree. He just has mush for brains. I don't know what's going on with this guy, but uh, he needs he needs some therapy. You know, everybody needs therapy, but... This guy needs it more than your average person. But I gotta admit, I do like some Rob Zombie songs. Rob Zombie's pretty cool, though. <laughs> so get ready for that cringe, because here it comes. Some girl in my public speaking class did a whole presentation on her boyfriend from a dating sim. <laughs> yes, yes indeed. Honestly, I forgot this sub even existed for a while. But this memory is literally seared into my brain. I still get secondhand embarrassment just thinking about it. So there was this girl in my public speaking class last year who's one of those weebs that really likes to broadcast it. Lots of anime hoodies and shirts, keychains and stickers of characters, and a backpack made to look like the costume of All Might from My Hero Academia. That's actually a pretty cool backpack. <laughs> I'd wear that. She was a super senior who switched majors in her fourth year, so I don't know how she managed to afford it all. I'm something of an anime fan myself, so I know it's all probably overpriced as f Once she even came to class in what I think was either gothic lolita dress or cosplay. It was lacy, purple, and way too small for her. Anyways, our first presentations were pretty chill. Just a get to know you exercise so the professor could gauge our skills. Most were pretty boring, I know mine was. I was kind of looking forward to the weirdos in the class just to break the monotony. <laughs> so homegirl goes up in all her glory in a cat-eared hoodie with thumb holes. <laughs> the first few slides were pretty heavy. She went into a lot of personal detail about a death in her family for a presentation to virtual strangers. Once everyone in the class was depressed and slightly uncomfortable, she switched slides from a single photo of her dead relative to a collage of pictures of this one white-haired anime boy. The size of the screen made each full body shot roughly the size of a body pillow, and each headshot the size of a car tire. She explained how he was her boyfriend from a dating sim called Mystic Messenger, and how she left her real-life boyfriend for him. She launched into this catalog of her ex's various flaws. He didn't appreciate her, he didn't support her, was dismissive of her feelings, never took her out on dates. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the anime character takes you out on dates all the time. <laughs> then she started explaining how this fictional character was better in every way. 
He was sweet. He made her feel special. He asked her about her feelings and on and on. She explained how this game is set up so that characters send texts to your phone and how she got more excited to get texts from him than from her real life boyfriend. She said she had developed actual feelings for this anime boy. The more she learned about him because they had so much in common and he's been through so much but he's still so kind. She even talked about how she initially went after some other character but he captured her heart with his mysterious past or whatever. God, <laughs> I'm cringing so hard. The whole time she was using his name and speaking in the present tense like he was an actual person. About 10 seconds in, I had to look down at my desk and do breathing exercises because I was so embarrassed on her behalf. Everyone else had talked about their major or their service trips or being a student athlete, so we were in a class of the most normal people you can get. And they all looked absolutely baffled. <laughs> then she dropped the bomb that her ex was from high school, so she'd been virtually dating an anime boy for at least five years. Normally the class clapped after a presentation, but it was dead quiet. <laughs> the professor said something about appreciating how candid she was, but she was half Japanese and you could see the holy f are white people really like this <laughs> lurking in her eyes. <laughs> I never thought people like her actually existed outside of basements. It was honestly the most surreal thing that I have ever experienced. <laughs> Oh man, the more I think about this story, the weirder it gets. You know, it all starts out with <laughs> robotic text messages to your phone that make you feel like a real person is on the other end, and it all ends with a, a robotic penis. <laughs> That's a terrifying future, and honestly, I don't think it's that far down the road. Probably robotic vaginas will come first, just because, you know, it's a man's world, baby. <laughs> But robotic penises are not far behind. You can quote me on that. I have definitely seen some like real basement virgin otaku types. Particularly one sticks out in my mind when I was in the Navy in Japan. Never left his room. Only played the DS all the time. The one time that we talked it was uh, him telling me that he could hear me having sex. <laughs> and I said, yeah bro, you should try it. Like I've mentioned before, I was kind of a douche in my Navy days. <laughs> so, So my point is... I definitely know these people are out there, but to leave an actual real-life human in order to go quote-unquote date an anime boy what or girl, what are you doing? Dude, I go back to my point about the dates. Does, does the anime boy take you on dates? She probably does have a body pillow. What's it called? Dakimura? <laughs> God, I know way too much about this stuff, but I still maintain my plausible deniability. <laughs> <laughs> oh lord. Anyways, let's jump into the next story. The Weeb Squatch. Yes. This one is just too good. First post on Reddit, Reading Weeaboo Tales inspired me to tell my own true story of living with a Weeaboo Sasquatch hybrid for 11 months. Note, the Weeb Squatch never presented any of the typical mannerisms of a furry animal alter ego, dressing in costumes, etc., and thus had a separate distinction as a half Sasquatch, half Weeaboo. FYI, it's a pretty long tale, but I've tried to condense it as much as possible. At age 19, I accepted a university scholarship in a city I had only ever been to once prior, and set out one fine summer day with two high school friends who had enrolled in the same university to meet with a potential landlord. We found an ad for three affordable rooms to rent in a house close to school. The girl, let's call her Hannah, renting the rooms, informed us that the house was her father's rental property, but she'd be on the lease with him as a landlord and would be handling rent payments and maintenance of the house while also living with us as a roommate. Hannah seemed cool, smart, and down to earth when we met her. After a nice chat, it seemed like we'd get along. We liked the place and agreed to sign a lease. It was a five-bedroom house, and my two friends and I each rented a room for ourselves. We asked who would be occupying the remaining room that was unspoken for. Hannah told us it was to be rented out to Matt, not his real name, he'll come into this tale later, a physics student who was going into his first year of university. We'd be five freshmen living together away from home for the first time. Cool, right? 
Maybe. <laughs> Moving day came, and my friends and I moved into our house about a month before classes started. Hannah was there when we moved in, but her room was in the basement, while my friends and I had the three main floor rooms, so we didn't see her for the rest of the day after she gave us keys and went to the basement. We met him the next day. He was Dominic, not his real name, the Weeb Squatch. Half Weeaboo, half Sasquatch. This creature was clearly the result of the most unholy of unions. Dominic was six foot six, 300 plus pounds of blubber, and covered in enough body hair to clog even the cleanest drain if he ever decided to take a shower. My shock and horror were complete when my friend and I witnessed Dominic, clad in dark eyeshadow, a spiked choker, and an anime shirt that I couldn't recognize that didn't conceal his belly, and also gym shorts, shambling up the basement stairs on the first full day in our new place. Still, I tried not to judge his odd fashion or makeup and greeted him. Uh, hi, I said to Dominic. Hi, he replied, not making eye contact. Are you Matt? I asked, extending my hand for a handshake and greeting. The Weeb Squatch ignored my gesture and walked past me to the fridge. No, I'm Dominic, Hannah's boyfriend. Having no other niceties to offer, and his bounty of refrigerated Mountain Dew in hand, the Weeb Squatch shambled back to the basement. My friend and I agreed that Dominic smelled horribly, seemed weird, greasy, and antisocial, and it was even more peculiar that Hannah had never once mentioned Dominic to us prior to our meeting him. Furthermore, we wondered how an unkept beast like Dominic got a girlfriend like Hannah, a cute 5 foot 110 pound girl of mixed Asian and Caucasian heritage, but for all our musings we had no idea just how weird the living situation that we found ourselves in would become. It wasn't long until we discovered the Weeb Squatch's dark basement lair. Like reasonable human beings, we believed that Dominic and Hannah would share a room, but this was not the case. Hannah took the downstairs master bedroom because it had an ensuite bathroom, while Dominic's room was the living room at the bottom of the basement stairs. If you look left at the bottom of the basement stairs, you'd see the Weeb Squatch cave. And if you went right, you'd be in the hall leading to Matt's room, Hannah's room, a half bathroom, and a shared laundry slash freezer slash utility room along the way. The Weeb Squatch's lair haunts me to this day. His basement living room had brown shag carpet and wood paneled walls. All three windows were blocked with tinfoil, ratty pillows, black sheets, and duct tape, while three to four black sheets, crudely nailed to the ceiling, constituted privacy walls. The Weeb Squatch's hoard was easy to see through the gaps in the sheets that were hastily and shoddily nailed to the roof by the creature who was on the cusp of understanding and applying the use of rudimentary tools. Disorganized piles of manga, anime, and Gundam figurines, various video game consoles, computers, video games with Japanese titles, clothes with no dressers or hangers scattered about, a love seat, some computer chairs, a desk, and a shabby double bed were all packed into the living room so that there was barely enough space to walk between everything. Several more black sheets, many more nails, and a month later, the Weeb Squatch's positioning and layering of privacy sheets finally closed off the cave from the view of a passerby. Dominic made no attempts to endear himself to any of the roommates in the house. What we learned of him was that he slept through most of the day and spent his nights watching anime, occasionally hentai. My roommates and I were all pretty sure that the cutesy sounding moaning and screaming sounds coming from the basement were not Cowboy Bebop or some other anime, and playing his Japanese video games all at inappropriately loud volumes late at night. I felt increasingly uncomfortable with Dominic's antisocial behavior the month before school started. He avoided everyone in the house, and when we did bump into him, he mumbled or grumbled in reply to our greetings, opting to speak in the language of Sasquatches rather than our native English. When invited to play Super Smash Bros or hang out, he'd grumble or say nothing and then shamble back to his lair. On more than one occasion, when my roommates and I were gaming and having a few beers in the living room near the top of the stairs, we'd hear the ungodly sounds of Dominic and Hannah banging. It sounded like a huffing and puffing silverback gorilla rhythmically squeaking the springs and frame of a bed that can't handle the beast's weight. It's amazing how having nothing but sheets for a door makes sound carry through a house. <laughs> 
Still, with days closing in until the start of school, we tried to laugh off the absurdity of living with a weeb squatch. My friends and I didn't care that much for the loud anime, hentai, and Japanese video games that often disturbed our sleep because we were celebrating our freedom from our parents for the first time in our lives. Hannah maintained the appearance of being pretty cool for a little while after I moved in. She was awake in the day, exchanged normal niceties with roommates, left for parts of the day, and appeared to sleep at night like a normal person. Then school started. First year university is a stressful time for many people, but the stress of school and adapting to a normal human social setting seemed to affect the weeb squatch and his mistress more than anyone else in the house. One month into the eight month school year, they started fighting. Loud arguments always seemed to be coming from the weeb squatch lair. The weeb squatch's deep throaty, seldom used voice contrasted with Hannah's high pitched, almost squeaky voice woke all the roommates up on school nights and got more and more frequent and uncomfortable to listen through throughout the year. The sounds of weeb entertainment also continued to emanate from the basement late at night, even though Dominic had classes during the day and the sleep disturbances had become less bearable for the group of freshmen sharing the house with Dominic and Hannah. I remember when semi-frequent lover's quarrels first degenerated into a full-blown mental health episode for Hannah. It started in the dead of winter, when on a frigid winter Saturday of negative 20 Fahrenheit, Hannah charged upstairs after a heated argument with Dominic wearing only pajama shorts and a t-shirt, and while sobbing, she opened every window in the house for no apparent reason, put on a pair of boots, and left for a walk outside for about 20 minutes, having ignored my friend and me when we asked if she was okay. The entire spectacle all happened right in front of me while I was sitting at the kitchen table studying, and my roommate was on the living room couch watching a movie. Stunned, my friend and I exchanged glances, closed all the windows, and debated whether Hannah was silently hoping for someone to go after her so she didn't freeze to death. The Weeb Squatch was playing some extra gross sounding hentai videos for most of the time that Hannah was gone, and sure enough, she came back pale, blue-lipped, and shivering, and still managing the sort of sob that only a half-frozen person can. She once again ignored us completely when we asked if she was okay, opened up all the closed windows, and went to the basement to not be seen again for the rest of the weekend. I still can't understand why Hannah tried to freeze the inside of her dad's rental property. A silent cry? For release from the bonds of her weeb squatch captor, maybe? Hmm. After that wintry drama, both Hannah and Dominic started taking their relationship woes and student stress out on all the other roommates in increasingly bizarre ways. Remember Matt, the physics student? His room was between Hannah's room and the weeb squatch lair in the basement. Matt really had the worst of all the unpleasantness associated with living in that house. Every conversation, fight, depraved fornication, late night hentai, and video gaming session sounded far louder to Matt than to anyone else. Oh, poor Matt. He also had to share a downstairs bathroom with Dominic the Weep Squatch. Matt was getting fed up with Dominic before the fateful winter Saturday and started seeking Dominic out to tell him to turn down the volume, be more respectful, and stop being such a mess. Unfortunately, Matt also made the mistake of calling Dominic a Sasquatch to his face. Dominic, being a few thousand years from evolving acceptable social skills for the modern age, began having some loud arguments with Matt in addition to Hannah, which mostly took place with Matt yelling into the Weeb Squatch lair, and the Weeb Squatch yelling back but refusing to come out and face Matt while Matt refused to enter the Weeb Squatch cave. The growing tension and arguments made for a surreal and disturbing roommate experience throughout the winter. Hannah, for her part, started having sobbing mental episodes more frequently. Some notable ones included her calling a house meeting to scream at everyone that our dishwasher privileges were revoked. <laughs> Screaming at me that the small quaint sunroom in the house was quarantined and off limits and that I'd be quote-unquote punished for using the room. Hazard taping off the small, completely safe back deck area where we had barbecues, and for no apparent reason other than spite, pulling the faucet off of the functional small sink in the half bathroom that Matt had shared with Dominic. For two painful weeks, my two friends, Matt and I, all had to share the upstairs master bathroom with the Weeb Squatch, while the downstairs sink was allegedly being repaired by Hannah's father. In one particularly disturbing incident, 
I was talking on the phone with a classmate I used to study and complete assignments with, and I invited him to come over and work on an assignment at my place. Hannah was eavesdropping on my conversation, came out of nowhere, and yelled at me that it's not my place. The house belonged to her and her father, and I was not allowed to refer to the house as my place. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> The worst thing was that most of us saw Hannah's increasingly erratic behavior as a cry for help, but because she was our landlord, and increasingly alienating towards everyone, we could only try to avoid her. By spring, with the end of the school year approaching, tensions were high between pretty much everyone. My friends and I were no longer having a good time living in a house with Hannah and Dominic, and we still had a few months left on our lease. Hannah was restricting our access to appliances and areas in the house that we had once enjoyed, and the feeling of being trapped was shared between me, Matt, and my two friends. On a school day at the end of the year, I came home to find Matt, along with one of my friends, packing their things and getting ready to move out. It was nothing personal towards me, my friend assured, but that morning the Weeb Squatch had approached them, bizarrely accused them of theft, though he wouldn't say what was missing, and personally, without Hannah being present, issued eviction notices to Matt and my friend. The eviction notice explicitly mentioned theft, and was signed only by the Weeb Squatch's clumsy hand. So they had gotten in touch with Hannah's father, threatened him and Hannah with a lawsuit, clawed back their damage deposit, and scouted out a new apartment to move into within the week. Matt and my friend warned that similar notices had been waiting for me and my other friends, but they had intervened with Hannah's father. Gee, thanks, buddy. <laughs> Who was, at the moment, at his home having a very serious discussion with Hannah and Dominic about the eviction stunt. It remains a mystery whether anything was ever stolen, or if Dominic was simply as sick of living with everyone else as we were tired of living with him and Hannah. The most victorious interaction I ever had with the Weeb Squatch occurred in the same evening. The Weeb Squatch, berated and torn down by his girlfriend's father, returned that evening looking utterly rejected. The younger, cockier, 20-year-old me, angered by the events of that day, played dumb and told the Weeb Squatch when he came back home, with Hannah and her father closely following behind him, that I heard he had some sort of document for me. Then, in a great evolutionary leap, with a tear forming at the edge of his eye, the Weeb Squatch tried to scowl at me. While attempting to process the complex emotion of shame with his primitive brain, he said not a word, but bowed his head and slinked off to the depths of his lair to lick his wounds, and understand the frightening new emotions that he had encountered that day. <laughs> this guy's writing is killer. Hannah and her father apologized to me for the drama, but Hannah's father, being all business, reminded me that one friend and I were still under the terms of my lease for another three months or so, and he had only negotiated to release Matt and my other friend from their lease agreements. After the eviction incident and the subsequent intervention by Hannah's father, the Weeb Squatch gained some small level of civility. Over the next two months, the Weeb Squatch learned how to use headphones, and the basement became deathly quiet, though I'm sure he continued his nocturnal lifestyle of watching and playing with all his favorite Japanese content, not grooming himself, wearing smoky eye makeup, and a choker with ill-fitting anime shirts and gym shorts. I'm pretty sure that the eviction incident broke up Hannah and Dominic for good, but I'm not certain. Hannah finished classes, left one day, and only returned to get the rent payments. After everything was cleared up by her father's deus ex machina intervention, my remaining friend and I resumed using the sunroom, dishwasher, and deck again, but the damage of Hannah's outburst was done, and we felt like unwanted guests in our leased home. My friend and I finished classes and rented a new place together, happily forfeiting our damage deposits to leave one month early. We spent a total of 11 months living with the Weeb Squatch and his mistress, and I still laugh to myself and shake my head sometimes when I remember the time that I endured living in that deranged house. TLDR, Weeaboo Sasquatch hybrid people do exist. I lived with one who kept a mentally unstable human girl in a dark basement... <laughs> in a dark basement cave as his captive lover. The antisocial and nocturnal hybrid referred to as a Weeb Squatch enjoyed playing his hentai and anime too loud, making life uncomfortable for everyone who shared the house with him. <laughs> oh. Damn, dude, that is just some good stuff. 
<laughs> I need a dose of that, like, way more often. That I, I love the whole story. God bless it. I could go on about how banning tenants from household appliances is way outside legal regulations, but that's not the interesting part of the story. <laughs> the interesting part of the story is the weeb squatch. I hope that Hannah ended up okay. Definitely hope she broke up with that dude and started doing better for herself, you know? She's definitely a little bit off her rocker to run out of the house in negative 20 degree weather and to even date a weeb squatch in the first place, but we all make mistakes, especially when we're young, you know? We're trying to find ourselves, and she probably saw this giant hairy mess, and she's like, I can fix him. <laughs> <laughs> Pro tip, you can't ever fix him. You can make some patchwork repairs, <laughs> but he'll never be truly fixed. That goes for myself, too. My wife will tell ya. <laughs> Anyways, friends, I hope that you enjoyed these stories. Let me know if you dig r slash weeaboo tales. We got nice guys, we got neckbeards, there's incels out there. There's just like this entire melange of cringy internet culture that we haven't even touched on yet. Although Entitled Parents is probably my favorite thing, so... We're going to get back into that quite soon, but I hope that you did enjoy this episode, friends, and if you did, I hope that you'll like, comment, and or subscribe. Check out our links in the description to Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and as always, a big shout out to all of my patrons. The list is growing so fast. So a big, big shout out to Mr. Weasel, Radimus, Cisco, Lady Nix, Nico the Legend, Damon, Darkstar, Crimson Albedo, and the newest, Dot, Nathan. Thank you, thank you, thank you to those seven beautiful people helping me to live the dream. If you would like to help me live the dream as well, Patreon is suggested, and we've got some pretty cool reward tiers. But even if you can't afford the Patreon, the channel is growing so, so fast, and I thank you guys way more than I could ever say for supporting me in that way. In the end, that is the most important thing, is you guys listening along with me. So thank you, thank you so much for your time. I will be back again quite soon. No more hurricanes on the horizon. <laughs> Although that last one... The fucker came out of nowhere. But anyways, I've rambled enough, friends. Back again tomorrow with some more r slash entitled parents. I hope you enjoyed r slash weeaboo stories. Please don't forget to wash your hands and keep yourself safe out there. I'll see you in the next one. And until then, friends, bye-bye.